All right. So, uh, welcome everyone to the first episode of Medics with Cigars. My name's Casey. I'm Ryan. And uh, we're here to talk about transport medicine with a northern spin. Uh, just a quick disclaimer before we get started. Uh, this podcast here reflects uh, the opinions and experiences of Ryan and myself. It is, only, uh, it is not meant to be a substitute in any way for medical advice or, uh, or clinical education. Location and details of these calls have been changed to protect the identity of all those involved. Um, all right, so before we get started, uh, maybe we'll do some introductions. Ryan, you want to talk about yourself and your background in EMS and where you come from? Yeah. Um, I started out in Alaska. I took a EMS course through the college there. actually got tricked into it. One of my buddies, I need a first aid course. One of my buddies said, well, take an EMT course. It's the same thing. And you get college credit for it. <laughs> and I was in college at the time, so I thought, <laughs> Perfect. So I took it, and then he's like, great, now you can join the fire department. <laughs> oh, right. Nice. So I did that, and I joined up and volunteered there, and that started in 2003, and I've been doing it pretty much ever since. So you've been doing it for the better part of, uh, like, 16 years or something like that, or coming up on 16 years? Yep, 16 years this year. Right on. I took my advanced care studies also in Alaska uh, through the University of Fairbanks in 2000. Eight two thousand nine. Yeah. So I've been uh, an ACP here in Canada since two thousand ten, and been working on the north for the last nine years. Right on. Did, you, did, you did some time. Uh, didn't you do some time down in Colorado as well working? Did my internship in Colorado. Did your internship in Colorado? Yeah. So because of the low population of Alaska, they don't let you do your internship in Alaska. You have to go somewhere with a higher population. Huh. So we went, my class went all over the United States. Okay. Um, and I went to Colorado because I had family there and was there for six months because I'm slow. <laughs> Actually, they, what it is is they have, they have so many students and so few training officers that they, um, you're only allowed to take uh, the three days that they work. And then they have every other, every other week they have a fourth day. And that fourth day is supposed to be their break from training unless they like you. Okay. So uh, my first preceptor didn't like me, and I didn't go on the fourth day. But then my other preceptors after that were all good. We're all good. Nice. So I got to go the fourth day. But you only get those three days in the beginning, and you need a lot of hours. So it takes right. a while Okay. to do it in Colorado. My buddy of mine did in Texas and did it in a month. Banged out in a month? Yeah. I mean, that, that seems really <clears> smart. Like, that's something we could probably talk about another time. But I think that's something we don't do as well in Canada is that – you know, they don't pay attention to the sort of patient populations that you're going to deal with and how much exposure you're going to get. You know as well as I do because you've trained a few kids up here who come up from Alberta or other places. And, um, you know, they, they, they just train where we live, uh, you know, city in the north, uh, which maybe doesn't have that kind of patient population to support that kind of education. So that's maybe something we could bring up in another uh, another episode. Talking yeah. about. Yeah, actually, because what's really interesting and probably good for a better episode is that most of the students that come up that come up here and, and train with me, they say that they they have talked to their other classmates and they feel like mm -hmm. they get better training and more calls up here. Oh, really? Because we have no offload delays. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Which so I mean, just paying attention to the total number of calls one way or another, uh, and uh, maybe just a little bit about just your just general background because you you've you got a kind of an interesting family history. You were all around the United States and stuff like that. You've lived in a few different places. Yeah. So my dad was in the Air Force. And we, I started out in California, it was where I was born, where my dad was born. And we, my dad joined the Air Force and we went to Texas for a little while. We were in Maine, Illinois, which is where my sister was born, or in California. But we, in California, we were at, I think, five different bases. Wow. Uh, so we were in Southern California, Central California, Northern California, all at different bases. And we were in Southern California twice. We went to Colorado, which again, my dad worked at three, four different bases because we were in the Springs area and they have a lot of different bases in the Springs. Wow. And then we were up in Alaska uh, when I was in high school. And then when my parents, uh, it's considered a remote um, placement. So you can go back to your substantive position after a three year tour. Mm -hmm. So they were there for their three year tour. They went back down to Colorado and I stayed there finished high school, started university, um, where I was actually going to be a um, television broadcast engineer, 
right. <clears throat> was my goal. That's the only reason we have all this great setup is because yeah. Ryan knows what he's doing, and I do not know what I'm doing. So we're very grateful for that background. But then I, I realized I really want I really enjoyed helping people. Yeah. The, remember I told you my buddy tricked me into joining the fire yep. department. Yeah. And I just I fell in love with that one on one making a difference in a person's life. Totally. And I couldn't find anywhere else. So I went back to that. Went back to school for cool. my advanced care stuff, uh, which is EMTP in the States. Yep. We just call it P school. Yeah. Went to P school and then I came here because my wife is Canadian. Yep. And so you moved up north. Moved, well, we are already north. I actually moved south to come here. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. This would technically be south, although yeah. still quite north by most people's standards. And yeah, you've done a mix of, uh, I guess it's important to mention too, not uh, for me to tell your whole life story for you, but you've done a mix of, of ground EMS and flight. Yeah. Uh, so I started out in ground, obviously, in a fire-based system. I did a short stint with a helicopter-based system um, based out of uh, Fort Wainwright mm -hmm. in Alaska. And we were we started out covering for their medevac crew was deployed. And so we were basically covering for them. And then we ended up, our the contract got extended. And so did that for a little while. Worked at a cardiology clinic All right. while I was looking for a full-time paramedic job, uh, which was actually a really good experience. Yeah. Um, got to look at a lot of ECGs? Oh, thousands. That's awesome. Thousands of ECGs. And then That's if awesome. I had any questions, there was three cardiologists there yeah. to help me out. And, Sweet. Cool. Yeah. And then, uh, then I moved here and I did air for the first three years mm -hmm. ended up having to stop because I have a lot of motion sickness issues as you know mm -hmm. um, and I built a tolerance up to every single drug except for scopolamine which I had <laughs> built a dependence on and didn't enjoy the withdrawal symptoms no kidding and uh, so I, I dropped back down to ground which is what I'm doing now still right and occasionally air you occasionally can help. help us out yeah, yeah right on um, awesome. Yeah. And, uh, and as everybody can see, we got this great background here, I think is really kind of very just typical of, uh, of just, I don't know, maybe it's not typical of Northern living, maybe it's typical of any sort of living, but I think it's a perfect draft backdrop to what we're doing today. And, um, just kind of sharing EMS stories with a Northern sort of bend to it. Uh, yeah. So, um, I'll talk a little bit about myself. Um, uh, yeah, I was born in Toronto in, uh, in Canada, big, big city. Um, by the time I got ready to leave, uh, it was probably like a daytime population of like six million people. Wow! And uh, yeah, uh, I went to uh, I went away actually to Ottawa, the nation's capital, for university. So I did a bachelor's in health sciences, and it's interesting to hear how we kind of how we kind of um, we have very different backgrounds, you and I, but we also have a lot of similarities in that like um, I really enjoyed helping people, and I loved that idea of one-on-one -on -one care, and I didn't really know. Um, where exactly I was going to find that. So I thought maybe I'd go to medical school. Uh, it turns out it's really hard to get into medical school. <laughs> and so... Uh, especially in Canada. Especially in Canada, yeah. And so uh, so I was trying to figure out, you know, how I could get involved. And I had never really given much thought to EMS growing up. Like, I, you know, probably like a lot of people are just left, right? We know there are ambulances. We don't have any idea what goes on. You know, the lay public has maybe no idea what goes on inside these ambulances. Yeah. So uh, anyway, I, uh, I, I applied to, uh, uh, for PCP, primary care, uh, which would be like EMT in the States. I guess a little, bit, a little bit different, a little bit longer education, but similar idea. And um, I did that in West Toronto. And in Ontario, that's a, basically a two-year course. It's two years. Yeah. yeah, it's two years because we have like a primary BLS system in Ontario. And then your ALS, they just, it's kind of like a year of extra training. So they teach you all the skills, but you kind of already have that basic training. Uh, but it was great. I mean, I already had a bachelor's, so I had a lot of that that grounding in anatomy because I have a, a bachelor of science in health sciences. And anyway, uh, I applied to a whole bunch of different things, and that was the only paramedic school I applied to. And um, medic school is actually really hard to get into in Ontario, at least. Is it? Yeah, it's really competitive. I think I think my first program was like fifteen hundred applicants for like seventy spots or something crazy like that. So anyway, I got in, and the more I researched about EMS, I was like, uh, I also spent a, a a brief stint in the military, some time in the reserves growing up, and then a little bit of time reg forest when I was in university um, doing training in the summers. And so EMS was kind of like perfect. It was like medicine, but it was also has that military feel of, you know, having all your gear with you and being ready to jump into anything. So, yeah, so I've loved it from from the get-go. So anyway, I, uh, I, I started working in Toronto uh, with the ambulance service there. Big, big, high call volume, ALS, tertiary system. So... I was really fortunate. I just got tons of patient contacts right off the right off the, the jump, and uh, I did three years there, 
And then I went to uh, P school. I went to ALS school, uh, which was a year. Um, yeah. that, I did that in East Toronto, so still in the GTA, the greater Toronto area. And um, yeah, again, did my ride outs in South Oshawa. So blue collar town, uh, but you know, still like 200,000 people, still very busy, high yeah. call volume ALS system. So that was awesome. And then I moved out to Ottawa to start my ALS career. Um, and I was out there for like a year. And um, yeah, my, my, uh, my wife and I decided to, to, uh, to, to come north. So uh, we came to northern Canada. And, um, and yeah, now I'm part of the flight team. Uh, up here, I've been doing that for two years. Went and got my critical care training in the in the states. So um, so some of my education is American. So we do have that in common too. Um, and uh, I got my critical care license, uh, my FPC with the ISPC uh, a couple of years ago. Well, year almost two years ago. Um, I guess in four months it'll be two years. And uh, yeah, do a mixture of well, mostly fixed wing as as you know. Uh, yeah. Other people may not know. And a little bit of rotor work uh, here and there. And I also do a little bit of. A little bit of search and rescue stuff on the side. So, yeah. So, anyway, that's pretty much uh, our background. And I thought, uh, you know, I did this really great call about just a little over a year ago. And I thought it would be really great to, to share. So, I thought we'd go through that uh, go through that together. So, um, yeah. And I thought, why just share it with our station? Why not share it with... We'll share it with everybody. Everybody. Absolutely. I'd love to tell you about this call that I did. Oh, tell um, me. So this is um, this was to, to date. This is one of the most interesting calls I've ever had to do, um, just in terms of like the the, the patient condition being uh, you know pretty critical. Um, and and, I, and so people know I've, I've purposely not really delved into yeah. this call because I want to find out about it in a natural sense. So yeah. I know the basic broad strokes of it, but I, I'm not, I don't know the itty bitty details. Yeah. And hopefully I'll be able to remember them <laughs> as we go on. I put some of it down on paper, but um, yeah, Ryan and I wanted to bring a, an informal, formal approach to this sort of thing. And uh, yeah, so it's a, it's an interesting case because it, it was a, a very, very sick patient. And, um, and it also, I think highlights some of the challenges that we face, uh, you know, working in the north um, from a resource perspective, and just from a straight geography perspective. So, this is a trauma case, and um, you know we're going to get into that a little bit. But as we know, trauma is a, is a time based disease process, and uh, uh, very time sensitive. I guess is what I'm trying to say. And uh, and you know, that time was not on our side in this particular case, and, and you know we did our best to combat that. Not just this case either. Working in the remote north like we do. Time is not on our side on almost any of our cases, especially on the medevac side. Anything, anything specialty related, yeah, exactly. And we're gonna, we're going to talk more about that as we go on. So um, yeah, so this call uh, was um, uh, at a community that we both know very well. That's about a, an hour away by plane, and it's about five hours drive uh, at best. That's if weather is good and. Maintaining, speed. Yeah, maintaining good <laughs> speed, um, and uh, and actually the the call itself from a ground perspective was an hour outside of the community, so in a very very small little hamlet, um, and uh, originally the call details we got was uh, uh, an MVC motor vehicle collision for those who aren't uh, in the emergency uh, care, and it was a, a truck versus uh, actually a semi uh, semi trailer uh, versus a car, and uh, and there was some uh, some talk of uh, of a rollover, and uh, the ground crew. We have um, we had a, a BLS ground crew posted out there, and they were on their way out. They were about forty five minutes out to the call. Um, so uh, the the uh, police got on scene first, and they found a, a patient who was uh, unrestrained. They were calling it partially ejected, uh, with right arm pinned underneath the rolled vehicle. Um, uh, this patient had reported fluctuating consciousness. And there was apparently large amounts of blood on the roadway. So I thought we'd start off this call just because, Ryan, um, you know, you have a lot more recent experience with ground response. I'm a little bit out of the game a bit. So I'm probably not as uh, well suited to answer these questions. I thought I'd ask you kind of um, your own sort of windshield survey. What are you kind of thinking on a way to call? Yeah, 45 minute drive going out to those call details. Um, you know, what would you be thinking? What would you be talking about with your partner? Well, with a with a call that far out, we're probably looking at an an entrapped limb. Mm -hmm. um, we're gonna need extrication. We're gonna need to make sure fire's on its way, which it probably is already, just because it's an MVC. Although you never know in the north, maybe not. But it's it might not check. be. So we're making sure fire's on its way. Um, this is gonna be a complicated extrication, so we're gonna be on scene for a while. This was in the winter, wasn't it? 
This was in the early spring, so early it's spring. May now. This would have been March a year ago. Okay. Yeah. So March, there's still snow on the ground yeah. most of the time. So we're going to make sure we have enough warm weather or cold weather gear to stay warm during the extrication. You said semi truck? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely going to need to. It's going to be a complicated extrication by fire. Um, and that's. I mean, I used to do that kind of stuff in Alaska, but I haven't done it for almost 10 years now. So I'm kind of out of the game, out, out of my depth now when it comes to extrication. But I do know that that's going to be a more complicated one to get an arm out. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we're worried about with the time that he's been out there, um, some type of compartment syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, are we going to need to... We we'll want to make sure we have IVs and stuff like that in place, but we're also going to worry about freezing depending on the temperature. So we have to make sure we have a way to keep that warm. Yeah, and we're forty five minutes out from <laughs> from a hospital. Yeah, so it's it's going to be a lot of talking about that stuff, trying to figure out how we're going to keep it warm. We all have very limited hot packs in our rigs. Yeah, so that's true. That'll that's, factor in more. Thank you for reminding me. That'll factor in more later. Yeah. Um, this patient's probably going to end up being hyperthermic if they're not already. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to deal with that. It's just going to be a very complicated call from it is gonna be our perspective. That's kind of what we thought too. We had already gotten the word. Um, and of course, we hadn't launched yet uh, because we, we can't. Uh, I mean, you bring up a really good point. that It's interesting. Um, I'm a, a big city medic by background. Yeah. Um, I, I'm feeling pretty comfortable now. Having been up here a couple of years, I've adapted to the way we do things up here. But... You know, I come from an area where I've got, you know, two trauma centers within, you know, half an hour drive really at all times at most. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, Toronto had like 15 total centers of which like nine of them are tertiary, right? So I'm used to having an, the challenge there was almost like which of these phenomenal resources, which is the best of these amazing resources. This is a completely different ball game. And I think you highlighted that really well. It's like, don't take things for granted. Make sure you have the people out there that you need, like the fire department, they're going to be volunteer. So let's make sure yep. that they've been notified and they're out there. And, uh, yeah. Well, in that community too, they're running a, a PCP or a BLS crew. Yeah. Um, and then, but they might only have one PCP. Right. They might have an EMR. They might have an EMR. Driving. Uh, so you're, you're, the resources are pretty limited. Yeah. You can, can they still bring a nurse there? No, they can't bring a nurse they in that particular community, that community anymore, so. um, because there's a hospital. Yeah. So we at least have a hospital to go to, which is good. I mean, it's a small community hospital, but it's not a nursing center. Well, um, in our nearest, best case scenario, everything was perfect. Mm -hmm. You're looking at at least five hours to a trauma center. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to talk about that more in a little bit. That's a really good point. And uh, I wonder not to get too far down in the weeds because I think we'll talk more about this in another episode. But I'm just thinking like, I mean, I know how I feel about it um, uh, now. and I, But you maybe in your background have had more of an experience. I've never as a ground person ever had to go and respond 45 minutes out from a hospital. I've never had to do that. I mean, here really? I do, obviously, doing ground response as a as a critical care paramedic, as of you. Um, and, you know, that's a little bit of a different game because we have a lot of equipment and yeah. we have a lot of expertise. But, like, I remember feeling powerless sometimes just being a BLS medic in Toronto because I had to deal with this patient who needed ALS interventions. I only had, like, an eight-minute transport time. So I can't imagine what it's like, um, you know. And, and I don't know, have you had those experiences? And how do you manage that? Yeah, because how do you manage that anxiety? You in know Alaska, I mean? we responded 45 minutes out right. on a regular, not a regular basis. But, but we, it happened. It happened. And, and then here, obviously, we do on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, it's, I guess you do your best mm -hmm. and you try to think ahead and you yeah. try to, my biggest thing and what I try to teach uh, my students and my junior partners is uh, try and think about what they're going to do at the hospital mm -hmm. so that you can be, you can get the patient as ready as you can to minimize the amount of time it takes for, them to get the interventions they need. Mm -hmm. You can't give them the interventions as a BLS medic, but you can prepare for those interventions. So knowing the next steps is critical. Yeah. So what I do is, I mean, this specific patient is obviously going to need an IV, but on, on patients that I, I'm not going to be able to give any IV meds to in, in this scenario, I'm still starting an IV. Yeah. Because I know as soon as I get to the hospital, they're going to be able to get the IV medications and that's one less thing that they have to do before that patient can get what they need. 
Yeah, that's a really great point that you bring up, Ryan. That's going to also factor into this case a lot is like, how do we minimize the time? Because no matter what, like you were saying, like it's a, it's, it's just flight time to a, uh, to a uh, major center, just the city that the major center in is three, three and a half hours. That's yeah. just the flight time. Um, so we know the golden hour is out of the window. Like we can't, we can't, we golden cannot hour. fix that. Right. Exactly. Um, and, and we have to accept that and, and, and we have to, we still have to optimize care just because of the sheer geography. It doesn't mean that we can't find efficiencies and doesn't mean that we can't, um, create the optimum care for that patient. So yeah, it's a great point. So, you know, just, um, just uh, building on that, we did launch uh, as a flight crew once the ground crew had made it on scene. And what we had, what we got from the ground crew was a 53-year-old male patient who had a decreased level of consciousness at this point. Um, they they were calling it a traumatic amputation to the right arm uh, up to the shoulder. Uh, it was. So he didn't end up being pinned. He ended up being. Well, so actually, it's it's uh, that was the report that we got. In, in point of fact, it was a it was a crush of sorts. I mean, it was a completely mangled extremity. So okay. depending on how you want to call it, it was still attached, but Partially unbelievable, yeah, amount of damage. Uh, so he was trapped due to that, but, uh, you know, it was almost essentially an amputation. Um, and, uh, yeah, so they're having a hard time stopping the bleeding because this injury was literally right up to the shoulder, right? Right up to the shoulder joint involving the entire length of the arm. Um, they were unable to start an IV in the other arm, uh, presumably just due to hypovolemia, probably just not. Like, apparently the, the, they had systolic blood pressures in the 80s and weren't able to get a radio pulse. So presumably the, he was just, the patient was just flat from a, from a vein standpoint. Was he also hypothermic? Um, you know what? I, I don't remember if we had uh, the word on that yet, but I, I think we can presume that he probably yeah, was. Yeah, so that probably how, didn't help with the IV either. Yeah, you did, you did made a great point about trying to keep the patient warm, and that's a, that's a huge difficulty. Actually, that's a... That's something we battle here constantly, um, being in the north, right? We live in a place that's uh, getting less cold every year. <laughs> that's a whole other topic, yep. but still very cold compared yeah. to, uh, I mean, well, Alaska is very similar, um, but, you know, compared to even the rest of Canada, certainly the rest of the United States, um, it's a lot colder up here on average. This is something we battle all the time. How do we keep these patients warm? So uh, actually, we're going we're gonna to keep giving the questions to Ryan uh, for right now. Um, yeah, so with this information you have here, um, I mean, you're kind of in a no-win situation already. You know what I mean? Like you're, you're battling some pretty hard difficulties. But what do you do? Like what, is, any ideas? What, how can you, you know, do your best for this patient with what you've got? This patient... <sighs> I mean, so you're thinking one. I'm in the back of the ambulance. Yeah. Right? We've got the yeah. patient. From a ground response yeah. perspective. Like, this is what the, we did have a double PCP crew. So we had properly, uh, not properly, it's a bad word to say, but like a, you know, um, more like a really a good amount of training in the back uh, compared to perhaps like an OFA uh, first aid three or EMR, a little bit more training experience, but they were having a difficult time managing this patient, understandably. Yeah. Um, what, what would be going through your head? Not that there necessarily is any. Well, stopping Real the solution. bleeding is obviously a, a big thing, but with his blood pressure in the 80s, no radial pulses, um, fluid resuscitation is going to be an, uh, an issue. Yeah. Um, and then I'm guessing it's hypothermic, so we're also going to worry about heating. The biggest thing we're going to – sorry. Yeah, no worries. Uh, the biggest thing we're going to worry about is uh, getting the bleeding stuff. Yeah. So it's going to be tough. Like it is Pressure gonna... points are going to be hard to find. Yeah. Especially without being able to feel a pulse, uh, maybe you could find some in there. But no tourniquets are going to be able to be used. So yeah, unfortunately, it's not going to be. Um, it's probably good that he's got a decreased LSC because we're going to be pushing on pushing whatever on we can, uh, applying as much pressure via like um, gauze and stuff like that to the entire arm because mm -hmm. maybe we can't stop. The bleeding up here but if there's an, like an artery or something down here that we can see we can stop that specific bleed yep. so maybe maybe Great pinpointing idea. different bleeds depending on, on what we're looking at yep. i didn't see the arm so i like i can't say for sure yeah i used to have a picture actually when i did this for uh, an m m that we had but i took it off but i mean yeah that's that's pretty much exactly um what well, we'll get to that in a bit but yeah that's pretty much exactly what they what they wound up doing and how they wound up troubleshooting that and uh um yeah you made a really good point i mean yeah. hemorrhage control any mm -hmm. way we can manage right and That's it doesn't true. have to be uh, i don't i think the textbook almost gets thrown out a little bit i mean there is like direct pressure and then you know 
uh, pressure points and then tourniquets. But realistically, it's it's whatever you can do because um, this is a life threat. It goes back to that ABC setup. Well, now it's now CAB because you have this, you know, circulation comes first because you have this bleeding issue. So, yeah, yeah. make some really good points, Ryan. And, um, yeah, from a flight perspective, this was kind of just going on as we're taking off. We know we've got like an hour down there. So the patient will at least be into the hospital by the time we arrive. Um, and I mean, the only thing from a flight perspective, other than, you know, all the, the usual care, which we'll get to in a little bit is, um, you know, uh, these are absolutely patients where I'm going to think about bringing blood right. now <clears throat> where this differs from other flight services, like, um, some bigger rotor ring services and stuff like that. Like they carry two units of O negative kind of just like all the time, right. In a cooler and they bring yeah. them on every flight. Um, we don't have that ability here, but we do, um, we do have the ability to go to the hospital and pick up a couple of units. So, uh, in the time it takes for a plane to get ready, because we, you know, that's another challenge of, actually, I guess this is a good time to speak about that now. Yeah. Um, that's another challenge we have of, you know, we, we don't have the resources to have a dedicated flight carrier, right? That like we can't, there's, we don't have the money to have planes that are just dedicated to us all the time. Um, no problem. Ryan's battling a a bit of a cold, which I had a, a few weeks ago. It's not fun. It's kind of making its rounds. Plus, you have kids, too. So that's <laughs> at least when mine's gone, factors. it's gone. I just have to deal with my wife giving it back to me of all these kids. Um, yeah, but so, uh, yeah, we have uptime for the plane. And, yeah. uh, it, you know, that's just that's just a reality up here. Like, we're, that's not unique to just where we are. Places all over northern Canada have that same problem. And uh, so anyway, in that time, we were trying to find efficiency. So we're getting our bags ready. We're getting the blood from the hospital. We're coming up with uh, my partner, coming up with a game plan. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of what changes it from sort of that perspective. Well, you um, were able to bring blood, right? Uh, we were able to bring blood. Yeah. Because so, even our hospital, because we're in a small area, has a limited amount of blood. Yeah. So, yeah, good point. Yeah. So these are all really good points to bring up, I guess, in our first episode to introduce people to some people maybe just are genuinely not aware of some of these challenges. Yeah, we I think our hospital only has 10 to 12 units of O negative at any given time, right? So I mean that's like that's like one really bad trauma patient. So we can bring two without a uh, at the critical care level here. We're we're pretty lucky in that we have a pretty pretty wide open scope. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of ability, but we can only bring two units of O negative just on our word alone and then we need a doctor's order to get two more. Um, we did call one of the receiving doctors in Emerge, and we did bring uh, four units because we already anticipate that, you know, partially amputated limb is going to need blood, uh, and especially again over those distances we're talking about, we're going to need we're going to need lots of blood. Now, when you launched, the patient wasn't at the hospital yet, right? No, they were just coming back. So, there was no was there a discussion about going straight south? Yeah, that was uh, already being discussed. Uh, the hot the community hospital was aware that. Um, the uh, patient uh, of the sort of patient they were getting with the ground crew. And I imagine, though I never really had that specific discussion with the doctors, I'm sure that they did talk about going uh, directly south. You know, if we had already been up there for whatever reason, if it had been like a really prolonged extrication, um, you know, I'm sure we would have maybe taken a helicopter out to the scene or something like that from the community, yep. uh, from our from where our base is uh, back in uh, the small city that you and I both live in. Um we did wind up taking that patient south straight from that community hospital, but we did rendezvous with them at the hospital. Well, that's one thing, like, technically, we don't normally go straight south without a doctor having talked to another doctor at a southern hospital yep. and having a receiving doctor at that southern hospital. Yeah. So without the patient being in the in the, in the the community hospital, mm -hmm. technically that conversation hasn't happened yet. So that's, it's a... It's an option, but it's not a guarantee yet. Yeah, totally. So, um, yeah, you make a good point. Like sometimes, uh, not usually with traumas, uh, you wouldn't think, but sometimes we have patients that need to come back to our, our, our bigger hospital where we live before we send them down to specialty centers. Yeah. Um, that was another really great thing. There's a lot of really good positives that come out of this case, and, and a lot of streamlines were found. And that was one of the things that happened was that the, the sending physician at the community hospital had already been on the phone to the intensivist down south. and. They were ready. They, from that perspective, they were ready for us Good. when we got there. So, um, yeah. So again, I'm going to keep. There's going to. I'm sure Ryan's going to. We got some more discussion points later on, but uh, I've got more questions for Ryan because really, I find this fascinating. Ryan's got a lot more. Well, just a lot more EMS experience than I do, and definitely more ground experience of late. But um, um, how do you find uh, handover? Because again, like I trained in an area where, like, I come into trauma centers and I walk into a room full of twenty people, right? Like yeah. that system's already set up. We don't have trauma centers. We don't have a trauma protocol. Um, 
we have, in many cases, family physicians and nurses that we're handing off to. So how do you find these handovers? Uh, good experiences, bad experiences, rooms for improvement, things that you find work? Well, like you said, the when I was in Colorado Springs, it was the same thing. You'd walk in with a trauma patient, and there'd be 20 people in the room, and they'd be looking at you for information. Yeah. And while you were giving them information, they would be doing things right. as well because yeah. they had standing orders. Absolutely. Um, so in, in areas like this where there's no trauma center, uh, we have built – a good relationship with our hospital here where we're able to call ahead. Um, we, and what's interesting here is we don't always call ahead. No. But sometimes we can't. We, sometimes you just don't have time. Yeah. Um, and so we are able to call ahead and say, look, I've got this patient and they are they're having these problems. And that's the information we give them. And then from there, they decide on a case by case basis what to do from that. Yeah. So you're looking at. You, you might have a doctor in the room. I think I could probably make a good case on the phone to have a doctor in the room when, yeah. this, when this happens. Um, you rarely have more than one doctor, though. Yeah. Usually it's just one. Yeah. And you're, you're going to have maybe two, three nurses yeah. max. And that's it. Maybe four people, five people. Um, and then a lot of times, uh, depending on the severity of the patient, you're getting in there and you start talking. Um, and because they're not used to this happening as often you end up getting questions before you're done talking which right. is kind of interesting yeah um whereas like when i was doing it you know down in colorado they'd listen to your whole spiel and then ask questions so yeah that's kind of uh i think that's a better way to go just because you don't lose your train of thought and you don't miss stuff absolutely because you're when you're, especially with a longer transport like this you have a chance to go through it in your mind what you want to say to make it as as succinct and to mm -hmm. the point as possible um and then Moving the patient over to the bed is something we still talk about with the with the receiving um, hospital. Where you know we need to grab this part and we need to do this, and it's not as streamlined. Again, yeah. I would bring patients into uh, Colorado, and I just stand back and talk, and then there'd be enough people there that they'd move the patient over. Yeah, right. Oh, why they wouldn't even yeah be involved in that. I'd just yeah. be talking. Whereas in this case, I'm moving the patient as well. <laughs> Yeah, and so you're talking and moving, and that can be that can be really difficult. Yeah, and realistically, you shouldn't have to like in a trauma system. Like the lead doctor, for example, is never involved in the transfer over, and probably yeah. the lead paramedic probably shouldn't either because you're doing a lot of thinking. Yep, but when you have uh, limited resources, you've got to improvise. Yeah. So the biggest thing from what you've said so far is I'm going to need to make sure the doctors. And the nurses understand that I have not controlled the bleeding. Mm -hmm. and I don't have a patent IV. Um, I haven't done any fluid resuscitation. And I don't have peripheral pulses. Yeah. And that, um, and that the limb, because we're at the BLS level there, the limb was entrapped for a certain period of time, and I did not do anything to treat that right. prior to it getting released. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I should just mention while we're talking about this, but you know, the ground crew. Um, and they obviously know who they are, did a phenomenal job. I mean, th these are crews that are um, not even on 24-7 in that town and don't get a ton of exposure. And, you know, even here in town where we are, where we have what we've called limited resources compared to the south, we'd have two crews on a call like that in town, right? I mean, unless it was a really yeah, bad we day. Yeah, could easily do that. We usually have at least four medics on scene and probably at least one ALS practitioner, at the very least, if not two. Um, they did this call with just the two of them over yeah. a long distance, and I think maybe they had a police officer in the back. So they did a really good job, and they, they were able to get uh, – um, I kind of jump ahead here a little bit, but they did were managed to get that hemorrhage controlled. But, yeah, to your point, um, yeah, you make a lot of a, a lot of great points there. And, and for people who might be thinking about coming, coming north, um, though you might be hearing a lot of, um, you know, challenges coming, you know, from what we're saying – there's an amazing opportunity because um, as medics, especially we have a lot of people here who have worked other places, we have a way to be, a small way, be clinical leaders. I mean, obviously the doctors are still in charge, but, you know, we might have more experience in how to do these efficient handovers and streamline trauma care. And I think, I think at least where you and I are here, we are developing a much better relationship with our hospital every day in terms of like handover. I'm finding anyway, handovers are going, because I do, I get to do ground response here sometimes and. Um, I'm finding handover to be really good. We just brought in a code the other day and the handover was phenomenal. Yeah. And so they're really picking up on that, you know, early notification, 
I'm getting like two doctors in the room on like regularly now for these like level one patients. During the day. Yeah, during the day. I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's that too. Uh, if it's a Sunday, uh, I might just be getting a couple of nurses. Uh, and, you know, we don't have RT and stuff like that, respiratory therapy. So, you know, sometimes we have to call in an anesthetist and we're getting that sometimes too. So things are getting, things are getting better, but it just goes to show that a systems-based approach, even if your resources are limited, really, really helps things. Yeah. I mean, if we know that we're bringing in a trauma, this is how it's going to go. I mean, that's where those big centers really, um, you know, obviously they have resources and, and specialty that we'll never have, but that systematic approach is something that we can, you can adopt anywhere and practice, right? So one of the interesting things about the community hospital that, that they were at is that they work very closely with the hospital, yeah. the, the, the medics do, to the point where they're actually dispatched out of the hospital. Out of the hospital, yeah. Um, like the, the call taker is in the hospital. <clears throat> Usually yeah. it's a, a nurse that dispatches them. That's right. So the nurse already has an idea of what's happened, mm -hmm. and they already have, uh, because it's such a small community, a close relationship with uh, the medics, like first name basis, um, know where they live type of <laughs> close relationship. Yeah, totally. And the they're going to be communicating back and forth as much as they can with the, the spotty communication is down there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, at the time of, uh, of our arrival at the hospital, um, there was an estimate that the patient had lost anywhere from 1.5 to two liters of blood. So, I mean, from the straight out of the ITLS international trauma life support, probably most people know what that is. Most people are getting trained up to that now. This is a patient that's like anywhere between like stage three and stage four of blood loss. Right. And, um, um, you know, just a little review on that. Stage three is like, you know, anywhere from like 30 to 40 percent of, of blood loss and stage four is like over 40 percent of blood loss. I mean, the numbers don't really matter that much, but we know that we have anywhere from like five to six liters of circulating blood volume, depending on the size and gender. So and this patient's loss, let's say a worst case scenario two, as a third of his blood volume. So we know yeah. that that's critical uh, sort of one way or another. So, um, yeah, all that stuff that you talked about, hemostatic control. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about fluid resuscitation, but realistically, like in a ground environment, that's, that's all you have available to you. Um, and then we're, yeah, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about blood. Um, so, uh, yeah, so hemostatic gauze was applied. Uh, I think you talked about that a little bit. They did a phenomenal job. They packed every bit of hemostatic gauze that they had. I think as a result of that call, um, all of our ambulances, including our, um, our flight crews are carrying more hemostatic gauze, um, just because, you know, we really thought about, you know, what happens if you have to pack a really huge wound? Um, and if anybody's not aware of hemostatic, I think hemostatic gauze is pretty, I mean, was it on the trucks when you guys were, when you were working in the States and stuff like that, when you were doing pre-service, did you guys have hemostatic um, agents? I guess they're new-ish, aren't we they? We did in Colorado, we did not in Alaska. Yeah, so maybe and it's not everywhere. They, they are now, I'm pretty sure, in Alaska, but um, it was still relatively expensive. Yeah, I think in Ontario, we were only starting to get them, and again, it was pretty expensive. But anyway, for people who don't know, um, uh, hemostatic gauzes are, are um, impregnated with uh, yeah, clotting factors or, or some sort of chemical that initiates clotting. And uh, it used to be like the shells of sea fish, right, or, or yeah, shellfish, like yeah, ground up um, I, I, shells. I have no sort. idea. I must be. I have no. Yeah. That, so that's a good point. We should research that. I should have researched that. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how, but I do know that the military did research on them. And uh, when I was in school. They, uh, they showed like um, studies where they'd like dissect a femoral artery of a pig and the field would fill with blood, obviously femoral artery being a huge vessel, and they would pack it with this gauze and it would completely clot off like a, a full dissection. of the So this is truly life-saving stuff along yeah. with tourniquets. So they were anyway, they were able to pack this, this, this arm and not to get too graphic, but the only way to, to describe it so people can visualize it, it literally looked like someone had implanted a bomb sort of inside the bicep and blown it up. Like the arm okay. was just completely exploded. Uh, and, and they had packed it, and then they had wrapped it with uh, pressure dressings and uh, actually a tensor bandage of all things. It worked. Yeah. They basically had recreated this person's arm for them and clotted it. And because they, they, you know, they're not going to amputate this limb at the hospital. They don't have surgical services, but it, it worked. And at the very least, they got control of the bleeding. So that was pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Um, they had also discovered a. Um, so the, yeah, the the limb was pulseless. Uh, to, goes with kind of without saying, and the patient had a, um, a closed left femur fracture. Um, so vital signs, initial vital signs when we arrived was 
Um, the heart rate was uh, 112. Uh, the blood pressure was 136 over 76. Wow. Um, but that's because they had started a levofed infusion. And okay. so, uh, and I'm going to get to why they did that in a second. I was going to ask you why. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit strange to have them on levofed already mm -hmm. uh, or nor norepinephrine for uh, wherever wherever people are, however they, noradrenaline in the UK. Um, uh, but we do know the initial DP was very soft, 80s, systolic, sort of at best. So, you know, that blood pressure doesn't really tell us anything. Um, I forget, do they have blood there? They don't. They so don't? Okay. The only place we have blood is in our local hospital here. Okay. So our, we have two community hospitals where Ryan and I uh, uh, live. Um, the rest of our communities are just uh, nursing centers. And the only place that blood exists is in our local hospital in the capital of our region. Um, so, yeah, they did not have blood. We had brought four units with us. Okay. So that was good. GCS was fluctuating 13 kind of. A little bit. He had that for like a moment when he got on the levofed, but he was kind of hanging around at nine, uh, breathing at thirty-four. Um, he did have a ninety-nine percent uh, saturation, but he was on high concentration oxygen. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, I mean, it's, so the the kind of twist in all this that I didn't want to give right away from the get-go is, um, we knew this before we took off. But um, when we got there, the patient's brother was with him, and he kind of reinforced what we had already been hearing, and that is that the patient's actually a Jehovah's Witness. And so for people who don't know, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, as part of their wishes, do not receive blood products. Right. So blood was contraindicated for this particular patient. So that kind of throws a huge wrench into and what made this case so uh, challenging, uh, but also very, very, very interesting. I learned a lot. But yeah, we, we, we brought all this blood, and now we're finding out that you know, the patient's wishes is that he doesn't receive it. Wow. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. I mean, do you have any thoughts on that, Ryan? I mean, like, I, I know that at first I didn't. I, I was like, oh, what am I going to do? I had to have a bit of a think with my partner. Um, but that's why the Levofed was running is because mm -hmm. they can't give, can't, that can't give blood products. Explains the Levofed. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, wow. So he's, he's already lost almost two liters. Mm-hmm. We've, We've stopped the bleeding, at least. Stopped the bleeding. So that's good. So that's good. But we don't know internal bleeding that we're... We don't know. Um, we, we know that he's got a femur fracture, so yeah. that he's going to be bleeding from that. Um, uh, they hadn't yet done x-rays. Um, they could do x-rays at that hospital, um, but they hadn't yet done any x-rays. We're going to talk more about that in a bit. But um, but we, we are presuming, at the very least, a, a femur. Um, we're pretty sure his pelvis is stable, and they had bound that um, as a precaution. So, um, yeah, actually, let's... Since you brought it up, let's talk about that now. Okay. Um, pelvises, femurs, these are other sources, major sources of bleeding. So yeah. in addition to controlling that external hemorrhage, you make a really great point. We need to also make sure that that leg is splinted uh, one way or another and uh, that the pelvis is splinted in order to control blood. Um, again, this is not something we do a lot on the flight crew, uh, as you know, since you used to do it a lot. Um, that's usually already done for us or we're not doing the sort of flights that require that. Um, if we're going to a trauma center, these things have probably already been applied by either our ground crews or the hospital. So what, um, yeah, femurs and pelvises, any, um, preferences or, uh, you know, things that you've done or. Well, I mean, for femurs, uh, some sort of traction splinting is yeah. obviously the, the gold standard. Um, Sager splints are what I used everywhere. I've, I've, I trained on the hair. Yep. In, in school, I've never seen it used. Never seen it used. I know that the hospital uses it, interestingly enough. Our surgical really? ward uses them if we need to transport patients because we can't take weighted traction. Right. Um, how do you find the Sagers? Have you had good success with them? Yeah. I've, I mean, I've been using them for 16 years now. So okay. I've, Generally they work good most of the time. Um, the biggest problem is uh, when you get someone who who doesn't tighten up the ankle strap enough and you end up with the... Just the, pulling it out. And yeah, the handle traction. pulled out, you know, <laughs> past the point where the door will close. Um, and then it's a matter of trying to, to readjust that yeah. while maintaining traction. But for the most part, yeah, I haven't had any problems with this. Do the you sleepers. find, because um, one of the things that I, I find is uh, because, uh, you know, I've only had to do, and I've done a lot of trauma, but interestingly enough, I mean, the femur is a really hard bone to break. So I find that my patients are generally multi-system traumas. Um, so I find that these patients are really hard to, um, it, it takes a lot of time to apply a Sager. Yes. When you have a lot of other stuff going on. Um, yeah. Do you find that or have you gotten pretty quick at applying it or? I used to be quicker. I'm not as quick here. Yeah. But I don't do it as often. We don't do it that often. Yeah. Um, 
but no, it's it's a process. But the the key with it is is that it it has it gives you that best chance of of a avoiding more damage from the muscle spasms moving those bone ends yep. around. Yep. And um, b hopefully getting that muscle tightened up and and avoiding as much blood loss and relieving some pain too. And relieving if some conscious. pain. Um, but pain's kind of a almost a side effect at that point though, yeah. right? Like I, the pain's not my main concern. Yeah. Nice for the patient if the pain's relieved, but my my main thing is I want to make sure those bone ends are posed. Yeah, because I I don't want them moving around. Yeah, and, yeah. And especially if we're moving the patient from the ambulance to the the hospital bed, from the hospital bed to the um, the the number nine that we use. Yeah. For metal, for air transport, and then that's going to be moved into the um, plane. All that stuff is movement, 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 movement. Yeah. And you want it to be as, as secure as possible. As secure as possible, yeah. So that's my main thing with, with femur fractures. Absolutely. Um, I found a lot of the femur fractures I've done personally end up being from some sort of handlebar injury. Oh, okay. Which are pretty isolated injuries. Yeah. Um, so, so you're talking about like motorcycles, motorcycles, stone machines, and ATVs. Stuff. Interesting. Interesting. Um, I've never had that particular presentation, but that really? makes sense. No. So yeah, so they, they are usually relatively isolated. You might have a broken arm as well, but you don't usually have any major torso trauma. Um, okay. Cause they've gone over, got caught and then hopefully they're wearing a helmet. Yeah. 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 Hopefully. Um, Although we know that's, <laughs> that's often not the yeah. case, especially, uh, Especially in northern communities. Yep. Sometimes, uh, sometimes some adult beverages are involved. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, I actually had an isolated fever that I took out of our hospital, and we had to use the Sager. And uh, this is just a little bit no, uh, like a note about analgesia. Um, that uh, that patient required a lot of pain medication. Yep. Um, so you know, if they have an isolated fever, they might need some a fair dose of of uh, pain management and. Um, yeah, I mean, any preferences on medications for trauma analgesia? We're going to talk more about that. A little Actually, bit, but... I do. Yeah. Um, I As like. Do I. What's that? As do I. As do you? Yeah. So, and this will kind of, it might sound kind of old school, but I really like a uh, fentanyl Valium mix. Okay. And the reason I like the Valium, and I don't use a lot of it, mm -hmm. like maybe 2.5, 5 at the max. Yeah is um, it really helps with the muscle spasms. Okay. And I find that a lot of times I can, I can pump them full of, of fentanyl or morphine, and, and they're, you know, they're saying they're feeling okay, but you look at the leg and it's just sitting there twitching. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Whereas you give them that Valium, and a lot of times that twitching will really relax, and sometimes yeah. that's all you need. And you can also, a lot of times I've found, it works well in conjunction with a narcotic, and you can use less of each. Absolutely. So they have a. Uh, this is where this is why Ryan and I are good pairing because Ryan is uh, is a really good common sense guy, and uh, I tend to get too into the weeds and stuff like that. But to build on that and be more scientific about it, the drugs have a synergistic effect. They potentiate one another, so they're both they're stronger together than they are individually. And uh, there's a bunch of six dollar words that I paid way too much money to to learn in university. But um, but yeah, all to say that they. Yeah, exactly. I find the same thing. That really good point that you got to be careful when you're mixing those two drugs because you know the chances for patient being overly sedated is is higher. I've done that with, yeah. a, with a little old lady. She had uh, uh, yeah. um, fractured hip uh, from a fall, and I, I gave her that mixture. And I only gave her gave her two point five of Valium, and I gave her we had morphine at the time. We didn't have fentanyl at the place I was working, and um, I gave her I think. 2.5 of morphine. Okay. And she still stopped breathing. Yeah, totally. I've had similar experiences. Uh, little old ladies are, are the, they're trouble. Little yeah. old ladies, they're the troublemakers. Uh, you know, in so more ways than one. They're yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I found the same thing. So I've now gone to essentially the majority of my medications and any narcotics or sedatives. I'm just going weight based for everything now because, uh, I mean, I come from a very protocol-driven system in, in Canada where it's like they're below a certain weight, then you just have the dose. I'm finding, you know, specific weight-based dosaging works really well. So for a lot of your a lot of your benzodiazepines, especially uh, like Versed, I like to go like point, 0.1 milligrams per kilo. Um, 
you know, and that's like a full dose. And then you can just have it if you're trying to, if you're going to mix it with another medication. So, yeah. you know, a, a regular adult, you know, 0.1, reducing that by half. Um, and then same thing with fentanyl, usually like one um, uh, per kilo, one mic per kilo, one microgram per kilo. And uh, usually, again, 0.1 for morphine. Um, I'm a big fan of fentanyl. I, 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 too, come from a system where we didn't have fentanyl. It got pulled off the trucks uh, because of fears. We're seeing that a lot. That's kind of um, rising up again in Western Canada, kind of near where you and I live. A lot of fears around fentanyl. A lot of fears of the population. We'll, we'll probably leave that for another episode. Say, yeah, that's, probably that's talk about that whole other conversation. Stuff. But I love fentanyl for, for trauma. Um, again, just getting into the pharmacology, uh, um, you know, it, it doesn't it's, – it's very uh, – Blood pressure neutral. It's not very vasoactive. And that's why I normally would stick with fentanyl for this. Yeah, absolutely. And if, if there are people out there who are still afraid of, of fentanyl, um, you know, let, let me tell you that uh, you don't need to have those fears. If it's a properly dosed, it's a great medication. And, um, yeah. So, anyway, not getting too far into that. But, yeah, that, uh, all really good points. And then uh, pelvises. Do you uh, – anything particular you do for your pelvises? This is an for interesting one. thing? Yeah. Um, you know, something I learned – here actually was and, and it might maybe it's a canadian thing i don't know yeah um but I, it wasn't a big thing were in my system is uh is using the straps from the sager yep. the, uh, the elastic straps um instead of like a, a sheet roll or a sheet um wrap or something like that and wrapping that around um to get a good tight thing that's also flexible Mm -hmm. And I really like that, and I've had good luck with that. Yeah. Now, um, I don't know why, but for some reason they've they've switched to a foam strap. Okay. In a lot of the newer Sagers. See, that it shows does you how, not how, work well. how rarely I use the Sager. I wasn't even aware that those were some of the new ones. Some of the new ones are foam, and okay. uh, they rip. Okay. When you try to get a, a tight enough bond for the pelvis, uh, okay. which is sad because um, I really feel like that was one of our best – um, things. Uh, I have a little bit of experience with um, some of the mechanical pelvis splints. Okay. I don't know if you've seen those. Like a proper pelvic binder? Like a proper pelvic binder, but I have never seen a ambulance carrier who is willing to spend the money on a one-time use. Great point. Pelvic binder. Great point. Yeah. Um, that's something I, yeah, well, again, we can, we'll, we'll, probably have a whole we can have a whole other episode about that too but i didn't do a proper literature dive on this but we have uh we have a couple of military medics in our uh in our service and uh there's some great military literature out there to suggest that probably dedicated pelvic binders are maybe the only thing that will give sufficient immobilization of the pelvis and you're right at least uh, in canada i've never worked anywhere and you know apologies to anybody who does work somewhere that that does have them but i've never seen it yeah. and you're right it's it's because everything in ems has to have like two uses right so yep. Um, apparently if you do a, a really good proper sheet wrap, uh, that'll, that'll do fairly well. I've used cravats out of a SIG or two. Um, you know, I, I've flipped around the, um, is that the technical term cravat? Cravat, I think. Yeah. We we'll use yeah. them zap strap. Zap, zap straps. straps. Yeah. Zap straps. Um, see, this is good. You're like, uh, nobody would understand what I'm saying if I was just here <laughs> by myself. Um, uh, I've, uh, Keds. Uh, the Ken Kendrick extrication device. I've seen those used. Yeah. You flip, flip them, them around. Yep. They've got Kevlar bars because they're meant for spinal mobilization, so those yeah. work pretty well. Anyway, anyway, not to get too uh, sidetracked, but yeah. So there's on, lots of different ways. On a side ways. note, we, maybe we should because they are with switching to the foam ones. Maybe we should try and write up a proposal to get uh, a proper pelvic binding. Good point. I know the sheets now, so we should probably do that. Yeah. And I know somebody else who can help us with that. So we have this patient with the with this large blood loss. Um, they're on a leave of fed infusion. Uh, they've got a fluctuating GCS. That we can't give blood to. That we can't give blood to. I mean, uh, we cannot correct the bleeding with uh, with blood products, which we're going to talk more about. So initial management. So uh, the uh, the hospital, uh, which was phenomenal, they put in three IOs. Wow. Uh, now one of them wasn't working, but two of them were. Okay. And uh, I found that great because I I just find that. Uh, Intraosseous infusions are obviously something we're pretty comfortable with in EMS. Yes. Uh, and we, I find hospital providers not as comfortable with them. Um, I do some ACLS training and train a lot of the emergent nurses and that sort of thing. And uh, IOs still haven't gotten a ton of capture, I find, in some of some of our, our communities and some of our community hospitals. Um, you know, I mean, IVs are, are great. And I, I remember, and this is maybe a side story anyway, it's funny. Uh, when they first rolled out the IOs in the, the hospital we're at, yeah. uh, I remember watching a doctor 
watch the YouTube video <laughs> before he went into the trauma room yeah. to give an I.O. to a patient. Well, um, I mean, sometimes that's, I mean, how often do we have in, in, in our, you know, I think flight services everywhere have to deal with this, not just in the north, but how often do you have to get comfortable with a drug that you have to give pretty fast, right? Yeah. Because, um, you know, it's not something you normally carry. And so that, that all comes down to just, you know, knowing where to find the answers and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, yeah, so that's, you know, it's become a standard part of ATLS and ACLS now. But two IOs, and they had given a, they had given a fluid bolus, because <clears throat> what, what else are you going to do? What fluid did they use? Uh, they were using uh, uh, normal saline. Okay. Uh, and uh, why do you ask? Well, I was, I was just thinking, I mean, I, we have normal saline, obviously, in our, in our rigs. Yeah. But if I can't give blood to a patient, and there might be some car- compartment syndrome going on, I'm not sure, and maybe you were already planning on talking about this, I'm not sure if normal saline would be the best option. Yeah, uh, you know what, I don't know if, uh, I didn't carve out uh, a particularly good moment to talk about that, but um, yeah, I mean, we could do a whole side topic on that, but your, your, your two main isotonic fluids are your normal saline and your lactated ringers, um, and uh, it's complicated. I mean, there's a lot of research that suggests that a balanced fluid, aka lactated ringers, is probably better all the time. Which is kind of what I was thinking. And uh, there's actually some really good uh, research, and uh, there's a few podcasts I'd love to shout out to, but probably should talk to them first before I do that. But there's uh, some great literature out there. I think everyone likes advertisements. Everybody likes shout outs. Um, but uh, there's uh, the Recess Room podcast, which one that I listen to, and EM Crit. Anyway. Um, I just read an article, I think, I think on AMS1, about how they're, they're talking about we should all be carrying lactated ringers. Also. We should all be carrying lactated ringers. Normal saline is, is a bit toxic to the kidneys. Uh, it does a little bit of kidney damage every single time because of the, uh, the high sodium content. Uh, and I'm a little bit weak on that research. So if there's anybody out there that can correct me, that'd be great. Um, but lactated ringers is balanced. Um, you avoid the choleremic acidosis with the normal saline. So you can make your patients more acidotic, which is going to be really important coming up with this patient. Yep. So yeah, really good point, Ryan. Um, I don't think, uh, we don't carry it, right? So, uh, even if they had had them on lactate ringers, we would have had to take a whole bunch from the hospital. Um, this is something, another thing that I've been talking about doing a proposal for. I've mentioned it to some of our uh, superiors at our service about switching us over, but that's, that's a tough culture to break through because every EMS service pretty much carries normal saline, at least they have done. Yeah. Uh, and so that's a big switch to switch over all our IV fluids, but it definitely seems like there's a good body evidence for doing that. So more to, more to come, I guess on that really yeah. good point though. Uh, they had leave fed, uh, running, which was supporting the blood pressure, uh, at that time. So, um, I mean, pressure is not ideal for trauma, but, uh, and we're going to talk more about that, but, yep. um, that was working. Uh, and then uh, they were preparing for uh, rapid sequence uh, induction as we were walking in the door, which was also pretty um, forward thinking of them. <clears throat> now, for a patient with that amount of complicating issues, what are you going to? I mean, what were they preparing for that? Like, that's going to be a. You mean like what? What sort of like special precautions special to take precautions, for RSIs? Yeah. What are we? What's going to be the process for a patient like this? Uh, it's a great question. I, I'll try not to talk too much about this. I, I have a. I, I'm really passionate about RSI, um, and uh, we could talk about it forever. But um, let's see. I don't do RSI on the ground here. Right. So I haven't done it in probably five years. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah. I. I mean, I came from a system where we didn't do RSI at all. And, uh, and then came up here and I've, I've spent a lot of time training with it, um, doing OR time, um, researching it. So it's something I'm really passionate about. RSI is, a, is, is something we shouldn't take lightly because it's a, it is a complicated procedure that has a really high chance for, uh, for adverse uh, events. Um, but yeah, basically you're dealing with a hemodynamically unstable patient. Now, in this particular case, uh, having a fluid bolus on board and levofed running is actually not uh, a bad uh, thing. Um, fluid generally for trauma is not great and, uh, pressors for trauma generally not great, but you want to have your patient, uh, as close to a normal blood pressure before even attempting the procedure anyway. So that yep. we were really grateful from that point of view. Um, what I, uh, what I go with, and, and there's a lot of people talking about this now, well, as Ryan knows, I have a bit of a nickname around, uh, our service. Uh, they call me ketamine Casey and uh, there's a reason for that because, uh, I, I love ketamine, uh, um, especially for induction. It's a great medication for anybody who doesn't know, although I can't think there are too many because it's pretty popular these days. Ketamine is, uh, it, it crosses, so it, it does three things. It is, well, it's a, it's a dissociative. 
um, but it can be used for um, anesthesia. So you can use it to induce your patients into unconsciousness. Yep. It can be used as a sedative, although it's not particularly sedating, but it can be used in uh, moments of chemical restraint, i.e. your, your um, excited delirium patients. But it, the, the thing that I think a lot of people forget is that it's also an analgesic. It also covers pain. And so anytime you're doing a rapid sequence induction, you need a medication that uh, produces unconsciousness. Yep. You need a patient, a medication that produces some level of sedation, and you need a medication that removes pain, and you have all of that in ketamine. So whereas you might need uh, fentanyl with, say, midazolam, um, you don't need... I often see people add fentanyl to ketamine, and there's nothing wrong with that, um, but it's generally unnecessary because the fentanyl would be taking the role of the pain reliever, and ketamine is already a super potent analgesic. So yeah. So ketamine would be my agent of choice for this patient, and that's okay. what is was was getting ready to be used. Um, um, and uh, uh, the the hospital was getting ready to perform the RSI. So there is a bit of a point here around interprofessional communication. Um, these are family doctors who don't do intubations uh, a lot. Um, I'm probably uh, doing more intubations, generally speaking, uh, every year than they are. But the doctors are the ones in charge, and the, the doctors are the ones that have this patient and are, are have them under control. And they were getting ready to do it. So I think as a critical care practitioner, it you know it behooved me to not jump in there and 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 take over this RSI, but to let them keep doing what they're doing and well, and, and also the side. to the there the the patient's still under the care of the doctor in the hospital, exactly. right? You haven't taken care over exactly, um, especially not when you first arrive. Yeah, totally. So they were going to use ketamine anyway, which was great. They were going to use video laryngoscopy which uh, I think is a, uh, an excellent choice for this patient because he was under C-spine precautions, which makes sense because he's had a rollover and we, don't, we haven't had an X-ray of his neck yet. Yep. And they were going to use succinylcholine for, uh, for the uh, paralyzing agent. And uh, that's the sort of last point of the RSI is that you need to have a, a paralyzing agent. Um, just a quick point about that is that, uh, you is know... Any, sorry, is there any benefit to a, a non-depolarizing versus a depolarizing yeah, yeah. So you're that's you're bang on. That's exactly where I was going with that. Okay, um, sorry. Uh, no, no, no. That's great. Uh, so, um, in this particular case, uh, not really. Um, so it, here in Canada, we have we, and with our service, we basically have two major agents. We have Sux and we have Roc. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, succinylcholine is lasts only eight minutes, whereas rocuronium lasts kind of forty minutes. And um, you do have some complications with, with succinylcholine. So you have the potential to increase potassium. Um, and, uh, and there's also the potential of patients with malignant hypothermia. Now, with this patient, I mean, malignant hypothermia, you can ask for a family history because the family is there. Pretty rare. So it's not a general uh, consideration for a lot of our field RSIs. And um, what would be more concerning is potentially the potassium because you have a patient that's had a large trauma, traumatic event. Um, yeah. however, um, if you're doing it within 48 hours, um, and I would say, you know, within the first day sort of post incident, you don't have to worry about that because that potassium hasn't, uh, shifted yet. hasn't shifted yet. And right. if you can do any blood work ahead of time, then, you know, all the better too. Uh, so, um, so that being said, um, I've changed my practice. So we use succinylcholine for this patient, uh, which wound up working fine. Um, I now use rock for all of my intubations. Because the reality is, is that it doesn't have uh, near the amount of complications. And the only real drawback of rocuronium is the 40 minutes of uh, paralyzed time. Um, that's more of a concern for like uh, anesthetists in an OR where they might be doing a procedure that's less than 40 minutes. Okay. Um, there's really no reason. I, I think a lot of paramedics, a lot of practitioners get lulled into this idea that a succinylcholine is safer because I only have to deal with a non-breathing patient for eight minutes. But the reality is, is that if you can't take over that patient's breathing for them one way or another, you probably shouldn't be doing an RSI. So um, I don't know if that makes sense to you. That's, yeah, it makes sense. That's kind of where I've taken my thinking now. And um, yeah, that way I don't have to worry about any of those those side complications. Well, and we have, we have so many backups now. Exactly. I mean, we have video learning just copy. Mm -hmm. Scopy? Scopy. Learning scopy. We have video laryngoscopes. <laughs> we have the King Vision. Yeah. And um, <laughs> we have the the Kings. Yep. And we have the and LMAs. LMAs. So two adjuncts. Yeah. And then we also have Crikes. And we also have Crike kits. So we've got a lot of options if if the initial 
um, intubation doesn't for whatever reason we can't we can't get them. We have other options. Absolutely. Um, that was actually really funny. I was just making you know my partner pretty well, and we were just thinking my partner can't say the word anesthetist, so we often say around the station tube doctor. Yes, I heard him <laughs> say that over the. And radio. we can't say laryngoscopy, video laryngoscopy. We're probably saying that wrong. Anyway, uh, yeah, you're right. So um, we have lots of different options. Uh, I always uh, ventilate my patients prior to intubation. That is best practice, although yep. there is a lot of uh, research out there that suggests that with a non-rebreather and a high-flow nasal cannula, you don't even need the ventilation. But I ventilate them uh, to do the nitrogen washout and to pre-oxygenate, but also to show that I can, in, uh, that I can bag them. Yep. And if I can't bag them with just the BVM, then before I intubate, I will put in a King LT to make sure that the King LT or, or LMA, uh, which are superglottic airways for people who don't know, works. Yep. And then you're great. So then you know your King LT works. You take your King LT out. You go ahead and intubate. If it doesn't work, you put the King LT in. And the King LT is an excellent device, and you can you can ventilate people in a ventilator through a King LT. It's not ideal, but it can be done. It yep. is part of the manufacturer's uh, uh, description that you can ventilate. So, yeah, so all those things factor into play. Um, so the physicians were actually, they have King LTs in that hospital, which is great that we have equipment that matches up with the hospital. I don't think it was planned that way, but it's great that we do have the same equipment. We're all trained on it. Um, the physicians tried twice with two different, uh, intubators with the King vision and were not able to get success. Um, he was a bit of a difficult airway, large head, and obviously we can't, don't have a lot of neck movement because of the, the, uh, the collar. Um, so, um, in, in airway, if you're not successful, change something, right? Right. Um, uh, there's this old mentality, just listening to this lecture, there's this old mentality in, in intubation that if, if it doesn't work, just try harder. And, uh, uh, that's a rich Levitan quote for, for people who, who follow Dr. Levitan. Um, but I, yeah, change something. So, yep. um, when it got to, to my attempt and now we're into a third attempt, so our, our percentage is already down. Um, I, I switched to. Uh, direct uh, laryngoscopy. Um, uh, video is probably still the preferred method, but we were already using that. It wasn't working. And I used a bougie-assisted intubation. And that's one of my favorite things I'm going to know. There's, again, great research to suggest that bougies increase first-pass success. A lot of people see them as cheating devices. They're really not. Um, I actually don't think the last cardiac arrest I did, which is a crash airway, I still used a bougie with great success. So, you know, I'm not seeing a reason to not use the bougie because the skill is still pretty much the same, except you now have a more flexible, smaller object that you're trying to pass through into the trachea. So, and and we know in EMS that there's often a lot of movement and people doing compressions or that sort of thing. Once the bougie's in, you have this sort of, it's almost like a, a guide wire, like you use in like a... It's exactly a guide wire. It is exactly what it is, right? Yeah. So it's just like a guide wire for a, a central line or an art line. Um, and there's reasons we use those for that purpose, right? So, yeah. It's I, like the I, Seldinger technique it for Exactly. Airways. Totally. Uh, with the, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm all bougie. I think I'll use it now for pretty much 100% of my intubations. Uh, it'll always be out. Time. Bougie all the time. All bougie. Um, yeah. And, 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 and it works great for me. And the other thing that I did is I, I took off the C-collar and had someone manually apply traction because you're able to move the jaw more that way without moving the neck. And so we had uh, stabilization. Yep, yeah, exactly. Not traction. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> we don't traction. supply traction <laughs> to C spine patients. It's <laughs> not our thing. <laughs> Promise. C C spine traction will absolutely get rid of all your problems. That's <laughs> that's not going to go well. Yes, uh, stabilization, um, uh, maintaining neutral alignment. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, that was very successful, and so. Um, yeah, we were able to get the patient intubated that way. Um, I don't think there's anything else to, to mention on that, but ketamine was great uh, because it, it wasn't going to drop us blood pressure any further. Right. Um, that's another thing, right? It's very uh, blood pressure neutral, and uh, we were able to ventilate the patient while they were ketamized uh, because they keep breathing, and we did actually wind up using sucks. But anyway. And here, we're lucky in that we have many options for our induction agents. Yeah. Um, so it's not like we're we only have ketamine or fentanyl, midaz. Um, we also have propofol. Absolutely. Um, we have we have midazolam. Um, yeah. We have other options too. We have we? Well, we have we have ketamine. We ketamine, have propofol. Yeah, we have midazolam. 
We have fentanyl and morphine. We have all the benzodiazepines, really whatever you'd want to use for yeah. that patient. We don't have Atomidate. Um, generally not used in, in Canada. You don't find it too often. Um, uh, but I've heard great things. You probably trained with it, I imagine. You probably uh, yeah, we trained for it. We didn't, we didn't carry it. Okay. Um, but we did train with it. Yeah, I think there's a lot of concern now about the effect that it has on the adrenal system. So if you're going to be using pressors or, you know, you have a septic patient, that's maybe not the best option. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, uh, I kind of just use mostly two agents. Um, if I'm not worried about blood pressure and I'm worried about a patient who might have seizing uh, issues, so I'm, I'm intubating for status seizure or they have a head injury, I'll go with propofol because we now carry it. That's, yep. We've only had that for like a year and a half now. Great medication. We'll go into that in another episode. Uh, but it's va very vasoactive and it, it's a cardiac depressant. So um, any patient that I'm worried about their blood pressure at all, I'll use ketamine. That's kind of where I'm at. I'm, I'm, I, I like simplicity. So um, I'm probably, I mean, I'm not an anesthetist, so I'm probably not doing things perfectly, but I find that that covers most of the bases. So yeah, um, yeah but you're right. I mean, we're really lucky here. We have a really great um, selection of medications. We have all these things open to us. Okay, um, so you uh, intubate them. Yep. We've got pressers on board. Mm-hmm. Put them on a vent. Yeah. What are we doing with a vent? So, um, again, I'll try not to talk too long about this, but this was tricky. Um, so, this patient was breathing at 34 breaths a minute prior to being intubated. Obviously, for reasons. Obviously, for reasons. And um, what I imagined the case was, and we confirmed that later with blood work, but when you have a patient that's breathing really quickly, um, you have, it's either a respiratory cause or it's a metabolic cause, right? We know that. And we can go into that more in depth at another time. Um, this patient, uh, at that time, we didn't think of any reason why the patient would necessarily be hypoxic, except they were hypovolemic, so they could be breathing quicker because they have less circulating blood volume. So that was definitely a possibility. We didn't have any uh, suspicion, to sus uh, no reason to suspect that the lungs were affected at that time, and we did have 100% saturation on, on high concentration of oxygen. Okay. Um, my belief was that this patient was probably acidotic. Um, so, assumption, I think. yeah, so um, our, our initial ventilator settings is what, I, what, what what's really great is um, we have uh, Hamilton ventilators, and we have this phenomenal. Um, mode, and I don't know what you used when um, you were flying, but we use it for a lot of our patients. It is... Uh, when I first started, we had an LTV 1200. Yeah, which a lot of people are still, still people, still using the LTVs. Um, uh, but the Hamilton, we, we have SIMD, which is a great mode, um, synchronized intermittent uh, mechanical ventilation. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason this is a great mode for us is that um, the patient can uh, breathe in excess of whatever settings you've got. So... Um, it differs from assist control in that uh, when a patient takes a, a breath with assist control, the, the, the ventilator will um, assist their breath, that's where the assist comes from, up to the tidal volume that you've set. So if you've set 600 mils, every time they breathe, they get 600 mils. That, that's great. Uh, the only problem for, for us in flight, as you know, is that um, bumping in, is you know, disturbance, physical disturbance of the patient is likely. The, the ambulance or the plane, the patient's going to get bumped around a lot. Yeah. And the ventilator has a hard time distinguishing between... Um, turbulence. Turbulence <laughs> and a patient trying to breathe. Yeah. And so you get a lot of breath stacking with that. So... Uh, I've seen that happen. For the flight crew, yeah. For for us, we use a lot of SIMB. Um, we, we transport our patients long distances in bumpy airplanes. Uh, it, it, so, you know, we can't often maintain that ideal quiet environment for these patients. So... We use SIMV so that if the patient is breathing on their own, they're just going to get whatever they breathe. Um, there's no risk to them getting, you know, hyperinflated or getting barotrauma, having a pneumo. Um, and uh, we just give them a large amount of pressure support. And so, um, so we'll talk a bit more about volume versus pressure. And I don't want to turn this into a, a vent uh, thing because that's a whole other uh, topic. But As I say, yeah, we should probably make that a whole other Make topic. it a whole other episode. Yeah. Um, but we decided to go with volume. Okay. I give myself a little spank for that because pressure probably would have been better. I'll talk more about that at the end. But we went with the volume mode and we used SIMD. Uh, I set it to the highest respiratory rate that I could uh, within setting parameters and the patient was just over breathing that, which was fine because we weren't concerned that the patient had any sort of ventilatory issue. We just wanted to protect their airway and keep them anesthetized because they're going to be in a lot of pain. They've got a decreased level of awareness. So we mainly just wanted to keep them intubated and allow them to keep breathing 
at the rate that they want it to. So that's going to factor in more later. But um, and that's really becoming more, maybe not even becoming. It's become the standard. Yeah. Is if a patient is breathing quickly before you intubate them, you need to breathe quickly for them after they're intubated. Absolutely. Because they're doing it for a reason. Absolutely. And uh, it generally. If you have to intubate somebody who's already got a, a really high respiratory uh, rate, uh, that's going to be a bad day probably for you because you're going to have to try to match that. But we didn't have a choice with this patient. So uh, anyway, we, we went with our standard um, you know, six to eight uh, cc's per kg tidal volume. So we started with six. And um, we, we went from a, a frequency, so a respiratory rate of like 28 to 32, which was the max we could get. So we couldn't quite make the, the, the range. We left them on 100% FiO2 because they've just been intubated and they were on 100% FiO2 before we can get some blood work. Um, regular um, IE time, a regular sort of PEEP, uh, 5, all that sort of stuff. And I won't get into it um, right now because it, it's not the focus of what we're talking about. But that, that worked okay. Our pressures were good. Uh, the patient was tolerating that. They were over-breathing the vent, but they were getting lots of pressure support. So little note, lots of pressure support for your patients that are breathing on their own because they have to breathe through that that endotracheal tube that you've got them on. So um, we had them on a high-level pressure support. So anyway, that's where we started with the ventilator. And that only, be, and, you know, that becomes a problem sort of later on. Um, yeah, so uh, the only issue that we ran into uh, at this point is we got the patient intubated on a ventilator. We've got leave of fed running. The orders we had from, well, luckily we had the opportunity to talk to the receiving doctor down south who is a trauma physician who knows more about this than I do. Um, and we said, look, we can't give blood. So the orders that we got were, um, you know, use fluids judiciously. So use them if you absolutely have to, but don't give them a whole ton. Okay. Did he have like an upper limit that he was looking for? Or? Nope, they didn't. Um, because I guess uh, the reality is, is that we had to do whatever we could to support a blood pressure. Fair. But the more fluid we use, the greater chance there was going to be of diluting the clotting factors, making them hypothermic. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a that's a that was a really difficult one for us, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. But okay. um, there is uh, more and more research to suggest that, like, what? Well, so actually, I'll, I'll put that question to you. Okay. Um, what when you were training, um, like, because I've gone through a whole evolution with my fluid boluses, let's say, or fluid management in trauma patients. Um, like, where have you come to with that? Like, when I was in school, um, they said you bolus them till they get their pulses back, basically their their radial pulses back. Um, and in, um, and I don't even think we had a limit necessarily on how much fluid we would give, but we 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 wouldn't necessarily give them a normal blood pressure. But if they lost their radials, we would sort of bolus them to the point of returning peripheral circulation. Is that similar to what you were trained, or? Well, when I first trained, it was a there was a blood pressure number. Okay. So it was we were bolusing people until uh, ninety systolic. Right. Okay. Yep. Um, and then as I progressed, I think by the time I was in P school, they were we were definitely trained more for our pulses. Yep. And uh, we were starting to talk more about MAB as yep. well. Yeah, that's um, going to be big. I'm going to talk more about that. In okay. But, so, yeah, yeah, so we were starting to talk about MAP as well and um, and pulses. And ITLS, I think, still teaches pulses, right? Um, yeah, I believe so. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's – now that I've been doing this for a while, I tend to look more at the MAP and I, and I do – pulses as well so what, what kind of map targets do you do you like um I'm trying to remember i haven't looked this in a while to be honest with you a map of i think 65 was 65, what we were looking for still still hanging still around the number yeah yeah because that's when you're getting good um peripheral renal uh, flow renal flow yeah so the idea is that the the first system oh, this is good we're gonna i was gonna talk about this later but we could talk about it at any point um, uh, yeah, uh, the, the first system in the body to major system to feel the effects of hypotension, mm -hmm. low blood pressure is the, the renal system. So the idea is that if you maintain a map of 65, all the major organ systems are being perfused because the heart and the brain are both at lower maps. Right. Um, so yeah, so same for me, actually, now that you mentioned it, when I was first, first in school as a PCP, because um, in some places, uh, PCBs could do fluid management. 
um, it was, yeah, nine, less than 90 systolic, pulls them up to over 90 systolic. Yep. And then ITLS and uh, then sort of advanced care school where they try to get you to think a little bit outside the box. It was kind of like peripheral pulses because that's really the only idea around 90 systolic because like uh, radial pulse is 80 systolic. So if you get 90, you're, you're, you should at least have a... Um, and I was already, you know, with the research that I had done from the major traumas and burn centers, mostly in the United States. The United States does amazing research on trauma and burn care, uh, especially out of the U.S. military. Military, yeah. Um, there is more and more research that suggests that um, patients can tolerate lower blood pressures, and uh, and more importantly, that fluid is basically essentially bad all the time. There's really no amount of fluid that is good for a trauma patient okay. because. Um, of all the things we already know, but just to review them quickly, uh, isotonic fluids don't stay in the, the blood vessels right. and, um, they, uh, can cause dilution of clotting factors and they don't carry oxygen. Yes. So, and they can cause hypothermia if I didn't say that already. And so, um, but we do have fluid warmers on. We do have fluid. Well, we don't right now. They're out of service currently. Okay. We're dealing with a technical difficulty around that, but yes, we do have fluid warmers for exactly that reason. Uh, and keeping your patient warm just in general. There are lots of different ways to do that. Um, and I'll talk about it now so I don't forget, but you were talking about heating packs. So because we weren't going to give this patient large amounts of fluid and we couldn't give them blood, we wound up stealing every hot pack that we could find. We didn't steal it, we asked. Um, and we covered them with hot packs and those old school ways that they teach you, the neck, the armpits, the groin. Yep. And that wound up being an incredibly effective way to heat the patient, uh, that patient started with a, uh, a temperature of 32 degrees and, and that was, you know, just coming out of the hospital. So it just goes to show you how sensitive these patients are. They were in a building still, yeah. but just being, you know, their clothes are cut off. They are, uh, they've lost this blood volume, which is how the body circulates heat, yeah. how quickly these trauma patients get hypothermic. And we delivered him uh, the patient with a, uh, a temperature of 36 degrees. Perfect. So that was a win. Yeah. And, and it just goes to show you that low tech can work. So hot packs, even in our planes, which you know can get very cold, it can be very hard to keep patients warm, worked really, really well. So use what you have available to you. Um, so yeah, so this was the big conundrum of this flight was that, um, you know, how much fluid is okay? And the, uh, the reality is that probably not much, but at the same time you have to maintain circulation. So we were balanced on this knife edge. We did it. There was a chest x-ray that was done for that patient. And uh, they, um, the hospital had like eight x-rays ordered, which is fair because they wanted to do imaging for this patient. There's no CT where we were. Uh, that's kind of the standard for trauma patients. Yep. Shortly after they arrived to get them a full body CT, we obviously can't do that. Um, but we had a discussion about, um, you know, necessary treatments. So the reality is x-ray is going to take a lot of time and it's not going to show us anything that's going to really change the management that we have. We would find some other injuries, but the trauma center is going to do all that over again. And the reality is we got to get them to that trauma center. So we settled on a chest x-ray. And at this point, you knew you were going straight south, right? We knew we were going straight still south to a level one trauma center. Two hour flight. It was like two and a half, two and a half. little bit longer. Okay. Yeah. By the time we got in the air. Um, yeah. So we just, and it's not like the airport's super close to the hospital. No, either. exactly. Um, so actually good point on the way to the airport. Um, I started an 18 gauge, which was, uh, not, uh, not easy. But um, where uh, AC? Oh, look, it says that right there. Yeah, it does. Okay. <laughs> uh, 18 gauge IV AC, uh, and uh, you know, not that uh, blind IVs are you know a, a great thing, but um, you know, just a little, just a little medics trick though is that when you have somebody who's super shut down, you know, the ACs are pretty are pretty much the same in most people, right? There's yes. two branches, and they, there's one that runs off the left, there's one that runs off to the right, and they tend to be in roughly the same place. And that was really important because uh, I love IOs, intraosseous lines. They're great, but they are not uh, long-term lines. And they no. do tend to blow, and they do tend to stop working. And uh, I did have two IOs at that point, but I decided to put in an IV. I decided to try, and we were able to get one. Um, so we got all of your medications are going through pumps. All our medications we got. Which is important with an IO, especially because you need the extra pressure usually to get them to flow properly. Great point. Yeah, IO should always be under pressure. Yeah. And, uh, and, and you know, I've only had a couple times had to run long-term infusions through IOs, and it can be done. Um, I'm starting to believe that long-term infusions through IOs are probably not great. 
Uh, and I don't know how much pressure those pumps really generate if they're just running, uh, you know, at a normal infusion rate. I mean, they are piston pumps, but um, but we had uh, so we had ketamine running for sedation, mm -hmm. and uh, we had uh, well, we didn't talk about TXA, so um, yeah, we had we TXA put, running. Well, uh, you got it up here. So. A bull, yeah, a bolus dose. Uh, I have to write things down because medic brain, man, it's gone. Uh, the TXA bolus dose had been given, so one gram over ten minutes, and then we were giving another gram over eight hours. Um, and, uh, I know that some services now are, are allowing, uh, BLS medics and, uh, and more ground services in general are carrying TXA. So well, there's lots of new research coming out on TXA again from yeah. the military mm -hmm. about how amazing it is. Yeah. Great medication. And, um, yeah, we should probably should have talked about that sooner, but, um, realistically in a patient like this, the most important thing is that we stop their bleeding, you know, both internally and externally. So, um, TXA is going to help us with uh, maintaining uh, those clots that are starting to form, right. uh, which this patient desperately needs. So we had TXA running. Um, in fact, we had called ahead to make sure that the hospital gave the TXA the second the patient walked in the door, um, because there's a lot of research now that says that you got to get TXA within three hours, and the closer you can get it within three hours, the better it's going to work. So um, that's something I forgot to mention earlier, but that's a great you know point to trying to find efficiencies. I knew by the time I got there, the patient was probably already going to be outside of the TXA window. Yeah. So we were able to get that in ahead of time. So that was really important. Um, uh, before I get to the rest of that, though, um, I just forgot to, to, I want to put a little question to you. This is another good one uh, that affects both ground and air, but um, <clears throat> uh, the chest x revealed the patient actually had a flail segment. So... Um, Interesting. Yeah. What? Where do you? Where? Where are you on uh, flail segment treatment? Like I know you probably trained the same way I did. Uh, bulky dressings. Yeah. Yeah. You still doing those? What do you What do you use? Do you find? I've run into a flailed segment, not a visible flailed segment, in many years. Okay. So honestly, that's that's where I am. Is still bulky. Yeah, bulky dressings. What would you use? Not to put you on the spot. I mean, sometimes you just. That's part of being a medic, right? Just yeah. like here's a flail segment. Go. What would you What would you use? Because yeah, I've. See, we don't have sandbags, and sandbags aren't sandbags would be good. Are, are, yeah. Or saline um, bags, I guess. I've heard of people using saline bags before. We just we were taught to put uh, big bulky abdominal dressings on and tape those down. Yep. That's that's what we got. That's what and that's all we have. Yeah, I was trained the same way. Um, so, uh, one of the things that's come out in the last couple of years is that, uh, one of the best treatments for flail segment is positive pressure ventilation. Um, so, uh, you can do that either via CPAP if the patient is a candidate for CPAP, right? Mm -hmm. If they're awake and that sort of thing, you can tolerate and then intubation. So that's one of the ways that we were able to manage that, uh, your eyes bone. I just, I just got a bunch of smoke in this one. Oh, sorry. Did did I, did I, did no, that was mine. It was okay. totally me. Oh, that is the, that is the hazard with cigars. That is. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, we had this patient intubated, and so we decided both with the doctor sort of as a collaborative effort that that was going to be adequate to uh, to treat that flow segment. Now, would that change? Your vent settings. Your vent settings, because you're on volume now, would that would that lead you more towards the pressure sizes as, as well? Uh, absolutely. absolutely. Okay. Great point. Yep, I didn't wind up doing that. Uh, I should have. Um, so that's a, a, definitely a lesson that I learned is that a pressure would have been better. The, uh, not to get into it too much, cause I think we will talk about, uh, we probably should do a whole vent episode, but as you know, with pressure settings, you have to watch them a little more closely because the patient can tend to be hypoventilated, uh, just because the machine's only delivering a pressure. It's not delivering a set volume. Uh, but yeah, that would have been great. What I chose to do is I, I reduced the tidal volume. So okay. to switch more to a lung protective mode, so we switched to a four CC per kg, and um, and that's how we adapt, and then we just Switch adapt to it or from it. Uh, sorry, from from six down to four. Okay. Yeah, and that's how we chose to manage it. Pressure would have been another really good way to manage that uh, that that issue. And okay. uh, we're going to do a, a literature dive to to finish this episode, and I'm going to talk more about that. Um, patient was getting ANSEF, so we had ANSEF running. Good idea. Um, yep, I believe it's cefazolin is the regular name for that. Um, Ryan and I have been talking a lot lately about antibiotics and <laughs> trying to learn more because I don't know about the other medics them. out there, but yeah, we're going to start carrying them soon and I'm not very good with them. I do know that Me ANSEF either. is for broken bones, so that makes sense um, that this patient be getting ANSEF. Uh, bone infections are, it's really popular for that, so there you go. And uh, yeah, and uh, avoid hypothermia, which we already talked about. So, so looks like you had 
four lines going? We had four pumps. two IOs and one IV, and we had uh, four infusions running. Four infusions. Yeah. Okay. Now we had ketamine, TXA, and stuff. Oh, no, we had five levofed, and we had a fluid line running as well. We were huh. running sort of a, a slow maintenance with it ready to bolus if we needed to. Okay. At that time, the blood pressure had been made. And that was the other thing that the physicians down south wanted was like low use of pressors because it's not really ideal. But oh. You know, a little bit of pressure to maintain that that uh, that pressure, but um, not too much to sort of tip the other way. So oh, good lab work. I was going to ask you about that, but okay. I figured you probably had it. Mm -hmm. so tell me what, what, what we're looking at here. Oh, it was, uh, yeah, so... Uh, the the blood work was was the most tricky part of this uh, this this flight. Um, we only were able to get a VBG. We did not have an arterial line because the uh, physicians uh, at this hospital don't put in arterial lines. Uh, we've since uh, got uh, put our uh, been given arterial lines in our scope of practice. That had only just come out. Uh, we had just been trained on that, um, and uh, had we only do them in the radial artery. Yep. And this patient only had one radial artery because the other arm is is pulseless. Uh, so I opted to not put one in because of the high risk for complication and to below the one available site that the uh, Southern Hospitals would have. Okay. Um, I, I think you'd be justified either way. So that's another learning experience for me. Um, I By the time I was ready to put one in, we, we had tolerable maps but not strong palpable radial pulses. And we don't do ultrasound guided arterial lines. So I opted not to do it. Um, I think that's fair. Yeah, I, I don't know if other people would have been willing to do it. An arterial line would have been very helpful, um, but I was getting reliable, non-invasive blood pressures. In an ideal world, this patient would have an arterial line. Right. But we did not have that available to us. So food for thought, I'd love to hear. I, I don't know if you would have done it differently, Ryan. I'd love to hear what other people had to say about it, but that's a tricky one. And well, we, we were now, trying to get out the door too, so I would have been doing it in an aircraft. Yeah, I'd have to think about that. And um, it, I'd have to be there realistically to make that decision. I can't. Yeah. I'm not going to armchair. Um, well, we are in armchairs. We are in armchairs. and <laughs> That is kind of the whole point. Is yeah, to, but I'm not going to question that decision. You're not going to give you yeah. too hard of a time on no. it. No. Um, reality is we had we had, um, we had had venous blood gases, and, and they were giving me uh, a lot of information to guide my, my practice. I wasn't concerned about the patient's oxygenation because the blood work we had in the hospital suggested that the oxygenation was okay. So I opted not to do it. So this is a big change from when I was flying, is you guys now have, um, you know, at the bedside gases and stuff like that. You can take that lab work. We did not have did you, that. You didn't have the EPOC when you, were, nope. when you were flying? Yeah, so we do have the EPOC, so we can do <laughs> full electrolytes and blood gases at the bedside. So that's an amazing capability that we have. Um, so we did draw a VBG. Uh, <clears throat> it wasn't good. The patient had a pH of 7.15. And uh, they had a CO2 of 50, which, you know, realistically, not that bad. Um, this is a patient that has a flail chest and a patient that I'm, I'm ventilating um, on a low tidal volume to protect that lung from that flail chest. And also, um, you know, a patient that was already breathing fairly um, shallow before. So it makes sense that their CO2 would be a bit high. Um, so that's not a terrible CO2. So I'm not, I'm not super concerned about that. Um, the reality is that that pH was driven by a lactate of 9 Holy. The patient had a lactic acidosis. And um, so, you know, I was thinking about this through at the time. Now that I've had a lot of chance to reflect on it, the reality is, is that lactate's a guide of resuscitation. So the only way to improve this patient's lactate, really, is to give them blood products. Right. Right? To resuscitate that lost blood volume. Um, this patient has dying muscle that's still attached to them, leaking lactate into them. So, you know... Um, the lactate got a little bit better over time, but was always high. And the research I've done since, I haven't found an answer as to any way that we would have been able to optimize that better. I'm sure there are people that would have uh, ideas about that, but um, yeah, we, we couldn't figure out a, a better option. And if you're watching this and you have an idea, put it in the please, comments. Please let us know. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, we still had really tolerable maps. And so uh, at that time, so we figured, you know, um, we're going to kind of let this ride. Uh, I tried to increase the respiratory rate as much as possible to capture the patient's sort of native respiration so they can get more um, tidal volume. A cis control would have been a great way to clear some of that CO2 and, and bring the pH up a little bit. Uh, but again, um, a cis control in an aircraft really doesn't work very well.
Okay. And so we opted not to do that. Now you've got hemoglobin and hematic as well, which is going to give us more of a, a definitive idea of how their blood is doing. Yeah, we have a hemoglobin of 70. So, you know, right at the point of transfusion, so not great. Uh, could have been worse. I yeah. mean, with two liters lost. Uh, mm -hmm. So you're just at that, you know, it's kind of conventional wisdom says you, you transfuse at 70. So, um, you know, uh, or below 70. So not too bad. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm going to do a little bit of a literature dive here. This is a, um, uh, a paper in the archives of uh, trauma research by Razimi. I believe his last name. I apologize for mispronouncing that. We will put the links to the literature that we're using, all of our references in the description. Absolutely. Yep, we will. And I've got a reference section at the end here. Um, but so uh, I didn't have this at my fingertips at the time. I was going based on my training, but I definitely did some more research. This is not something we encounter every day, but uh, oh. basically stuff that you and I are talking about. Um, there is no definitive answer on whether pressure or volume, like there's no scientific research that says for sure that pressure is better than volume. Okay. So we're basically basing that off of physiology, which I think makes sense. I think you made yeah. a great point. Pressure probably would have been better, but at least the good news is we don't have any definitive answer that says volume is worse. So uh, low total volumes, which, you know, less than six cc's per kg, we were doing that. Um, FiO2, you know, as low as you can, right? Because oxygen is is toxic to people, especially people that are in a trauma situation. Um, so, you know, um, patient was oxygenating okay. You know, I wasn't going to let the SpO2 go below 90, but I think we had stats in like the 93, 94 range, so that was fine. Nice. I think we were able to get them down to about an FiO2 of 60. A um, little bit of PEEP, um, not too much uh, to avoid, you know, that increased pressure in the chest, dropping the blood pressure. And well, that's basically um, physiological at that point, right? Exactly. Just physiological PEEP. Um, keeping the pressures below 30. Uh, this paper said less than 28. So, I mean, you know, yeah. uh, basically what we already know. But what I found interesting is that this paper says that for chest trauma, um, you know, uh, because of the, this strategy, um, you're going to have a lower pH. So it says that a pH as low as 7.2 is tolerable. Wow. So we weren't too far off that. And uh, by the time we were able to get the patient to the hospital, uh, we were able to get the pH above 7.2. And we just kind of let it sit there. Nice. Um, and we had a whole discussion about bicarbonate, and that's a whole other episode. But um, yeah, I don't know. Does it work for you? Yeah, that works <clears> for me. Uh, we did have a drop of MAP to 55. Um, so we did wind up doing a low fluid bolus, so 10 cc's per kg. Um, I don't know if, if there's different numbers that you use. We, I, I kind of go with like a 20 mil per kg is like a normal. Yeah. Sepsis is like a 30 per kg. And then 10 cc is like a, you know, cardiac patient or anybody that can't tolerate a lot of yeah. fluid. These are kind of the numbers that I use. I mean, that's, and that, yeah, that's what we're taught. Yeah. Yeah. So. I don't think there's anything. Um, so we sort of stayed in a map of 55. Uh, we increased the leave fed, uh, up by two. Um, so we're up to about four mics per minute. So not too high. I was still going with, uh, you know, two to 20 per minute. Uh, back then, I've s since switched my practice to weight-based uh, pressors. Okay. Um, I'm finding that quite interesting because there's still even the ho even the receiving trauma hospital that we went to, which is a a very big trauma hospital that's world renowned in trauma care. They're still using well, at the time we're still using two to twenty, and there are a lot of big hospitals that actually are still using the two to twenty. I think the research is pretty definitive now that weight-based is the way to go. But weight-based is becoming the way to go for, for almost everything. everything. I agree. I mean. It's just a matter, is it actual weight, weight base or ideal weight base? It depends yep. on what you're doing. But. Yep, totally. Um, so we were able to get a map of 60, and so that's not quite at that 65 marker that you were talking about. But, you know, again... Um, you had a fully in place, right? We had a fully in place. To the about output? Great, great point. So uh, we were looking at some fluid output. We did have some fluid output, but we weren't, we weren't kind of hitting that 0.5 mils per kg output that we would have liked to have seen. So, okay, so it's reduced, but that makes sense. At the same time, yeah. So this was kind of a, a difficult one because it's like, yeah, we're not in an optimum place because uh, realistically, you know, there's a lot of things about this case that aren't optimal. A trauma patient really far from a trauma center and no blood. Yeah. So it becomes a question of like what was going through my head a lot was, okay, I, this is not where I want the patient to be, but is there anything that I can safely do that's going to put them to where I want them to be? Right. You know, and I, I have a question I wanted to put to you about that um, uh, afterwards. So we already talked about all that. Um, 
Well, that one it said urine output, which was <laughs> urine output as a as a as a marker, yeah, yeah, for perfusion. So yeah, I think that's I agree. I, I'm with you on that. Urine output's a great marker for for perfusion, and um, uh, so yeah, total time. So by the time we arrived at the hospital, uh, this patient had been seven hours post event, and so you know. I mean, that I think highlights kind of what we're, what we're doing here, right? Like what we're talking about. This is, these are the challenges we face. I don't think there's any way we could have um, improved on that time. I think every efficiency was found, really, with the exception of going straight from the scene to, uh, you know, a rendezvous at the airport. Yeah, but, I mean, you could have saved a little bit of time, but you wouldn't have found the fluid segment. Nope. Which means your vent settings would have been... Well, okay, it would have, wouldn't have been as ideal. Yep. And I think that, that for a long flight like that, you want as ideal vent settings as you can get. Yep. Um, they already had IOs in place. They already had IOs in place, and they already given fluid bolses. Yep. So I think... Would have had to do an RSI at the airport as yeah, opposed to a hospital. in the plane. Right? No con confirmation. No, um, no tube confirmation. No tube confirmation. The PCVs would have been stuck there at the airport managing this patient for probably a little while, waiting for yeah. us to get there. No so doctor. I, I think in this case, it might have been detrimental to have done a, a airport meet. Yeah. Yeah. Personally. Yeah. I mean, I think you got to make that decision on a case by case basis. But yeah, I think, you know, I, I think we did the best that we could. And, um, you know, the patient had already survived the initial insult. So they, you know, they had a potential to, to, to sort of go the distance. Um, blood would have made a huge difference in this case. Um, but yeah, uh, interesting little sort of side tidbit. Um, when we landed, our uh, humeral IO uh, stopped working. We had two infusions, I think, running through that. So two of our pumps started alarming just as we're coming in on final. So awesome. that was exciting to deal with. Um, the long story short is that by the time we arrived at the trauma center, the only working line was the 18 gauge. Well, that's a good thing you found it then. So, <laughs> you know, I think the moral of the story that I get from it is uh, IOs are great short term. Yes. If you can get an IV, always try to get an IV as well, um, is what I learned from that. Um, I don't know how you feel about it. I, I, I give a lot of, I do a lot of IOs for my cardiac arrest. With the exception of that, I'm always trying to get a, an intravenous line first. Yeah, well, I mean... IOs will clot off and yeah. blow eventually, no matter what. Yeah, but they're just not. Yeah, they're not. I, they're not a long-term solution, like you said. And the fact that this one blew on landing—that's not completely unusual either. You got all the pressure changes and the mm -hmm. um, more turbulence and stuff like that. I think the fact that it lasted five hours, pretty much at that pretty point, good. was pretty good. So yeah. we had already given the full dose of TXA. Um, the blood gases were improving, blood pressure was holding, lactate, uh, oh, I, I saw it in the CL memory fa fails you, lactate was actually getting worse, which makes sense, and the hemoglobin was still dropping, but at this point, the patient was in a major trauma center, so, um, and there was a Jehovah's Witness advocate at the bedside when we arrived, which was, uh, I didn't even know those existed. Me neither, so I'll, I'll kind of wrap up with that a little bit in a second. Mm -hmm. Um, so... In the hospital, first thing they did was they put a large bore central line in. So that addresses the vascular concerns that we were talking about. Makes sense. Um, they gave a large fluid bolus uh, because the uh, blood pressure was dropping. So I found that interesting. The, the doctor that we had spoken to who was receiving was not the one that we were handing off to. We we're handing over to a surgery resident. They decided to give a large fluid bolus, um, which, you know, that's fine. I mean, um, they were... Still normal saline at this point? Still normal saline. Okay. Um, and they were discussing sort of treatment options with the Jehovah's Witness Advocate. Okay. They inserted an art line, and it makes perfect sense, and they left the low-dose vasopressor, and they admitted them to ICU. Um, so uh, here's what I kind of took from, from uh, sort of this case. Uh, <clears throat> so one last dive into the literature. Um, how do you manage a Jehovah's Witness patient, right? Like, this is something that I had never encountered before. I've had patients who are Jehovah's Witness patients before. I've had, you know, many different patients with different uh, spiritual or, or just philosophical beliefs uh, in terms of what treatment they wanted to receive or didn't want to receive. But I'd never had a patient who, you know, was refusing to get what the thing they absolutely needed. Um, but 
this is not something that hasn't been encountered before. And there is actually some amazing high quality literature on how to treat Jehovah's Witness patients. Um, the reality is, is that patient would not have been a candidate for surgery when he arrived because he was too unstable. Okay. So what they do is uh, the patients are given a high dose regimen of erythropoietin, which is the hormone that causes the stimulation of red blood cell production. Okay. And they give them a uh, vitamin B12 shot or not B12, it's a B complex shot. Okay. And uh, they watch them in ICU and they uh, allow them to regenerate their own um, uh, red blood cells and they wait for them to obtain a hemoglobin of 90 and then they send them off to surgery. Wow. Um, that's, that's what, uh, this is from a, a journal in the uh, British Journal of Anesthesia um, and it's called the Perioperative Jehovah's Witness. Uh, it's a review, so we'll link uh, into it. It's just one of many papers. There are different ways. This isn't definitive, but there are whole treatment protocols around uh, these patients. And what I think is important to recognize is that, um, uh, I mean, you and I both uh, have spiritual beliefs, uh, and people come from all sorts of different backgrounds. And the important thing to remember is that uh, patient's autonomy is, is, is the utmost importance. So just because it puts us in a difficult situation or it makes us uncomfortable, um, if the people have the capacity to make these decisions, they should absolutely be respected. Yeah. And um, the Jehovah's Witness community is amazing for advocating for their patients. Uh, um, before there was any family that was able to get down there, because they were all coming from out of town, there was somebody from that community that was there to talk with the physician about this patient's beliefs. And though it may, you know, though it's a very difficult situation, um, I, I found that inspiring in a lot of ways. And it reconfirmed my commitment to, uh, uh, yeah, to to patient capacity and autonomy. Well, I think, I mean, a lot of times it, it uh, you run into some of those same problems with like DNRs, mm -hmm. especially DNRs for people who are younger that, that might have some chronic illness that they, that are terminal illness that, that you sit there and go, but I can help you. And respecting the patient's wishes is the, the number one thing to do every time. Yeah. Right. You, you can't go against the patient wishes because Absolutely. it's that's not it's not your place. Yeah, and we run into that with the DNRs. And now that they've legalized um, medically assisted death. medically assisted death, I was looking for the PC term for that. Yeah, um, made as it's called up here in Canada. It's it's a discussion that's even more important yep. because that's something that a lot of people have ethical uh, strong ethical opinions around. Yep, and Again, it comes down to what the patient wants. Yep. And and all of these are linked in that one aspect. And we are going to run into them, especially here in Canada, more and more. Um, and we have to we have to be willing to accept that. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And and uh, people have the right to informed consent, and they have the right to informed consent over every individual treatment. And um, the reality is, is it's really easy. Uh, because we have this wonderful training and education that we've been given to start believing that we know what's best for people. And the reality is that uh, we don't. And uh, even sometimes things that are, you know, objectively good for them, it's not something they want. And, and you know, I know that you and I are both big believers in individual liberties. And, uh, you know, just aside from the fact that it's a, it's a legal standpoint, but, you know, um, this is somebody's, this is somebody's body. This is somebody's belief. And, um, so, you know, it was uh, it was incredibly difficult to deal with uh, from a, from a provider point of view. But, you know, that's that's just part of the game. And so, yeah, so it was a it was a great, great experience for me. I learned a lot. Um, and uh, I think I don't know if you had any other points. I just thought I'd do a little bit of a wrap up, kind of give us the take home points. Yeah. Do you have any other questions or anything like that? Uh, I I'm curious about how it all turned out, but I think we're going to get to there. We're going to get there, yeah. So, so just a total wrap, just a complete wrap up on the whole case. Um, uh, so, the treatment points for this patient, for all trauma patients, especially for Jehovah's Witness patients, minimizing blood loss. So, uh, fluid replacement if possible. Uh, if fluids are all you have, uh, use them, but use them judiciously. Um, you know, that's there's a lot of good research that suggests that patients basically need blood. Um, and, and that blood is really the only resuscitative fluid. Uh, but uh, you work with what you have, uh, with the good clinical knowledge that you have. Um, <laughs> surgery is obviously the um, penultimate treatment for trauma. 
Um, it, however, some patients are not candidates for surgery right away. And as we know, we can't always get the patients in surgery. Our hospital here does some surgeries. Most major surgeries are going to be done down south. But the sure. idea is that we got to get them to that place of surgical care as quickly as we can. Reboa is an option for these patients. Um, so uh, Reboa is uh, something we can talk about another time in depth, but it's a, a, a endovascular procedure in which they thread basically a, an angio balloon up into the artery and close off the bleeding internally. Okay. This patient wouldn't have been a candidate for that because the main bleeding is coming from their arm. But if you have a pelvis or a, a femur or a renal artery, they can they can close that off with Rebola. Um, uh, another thing that the major uh, systems do is they sort of will take blood off of, say, chest tubes and stuff like that and keep it sterile and reintroduce the patient's own blood to wow. them because that's that would be allowed, right? The, uh, a patient who does not accept blood transfusions can accept their own blood transfusions. Or if they happen, some patients, you know, give blood ahead of time so they can do that. Um, tourniquets uh, or pressure points or hemostatic dressings, we covered sort of all of that. Yep. And then permissive, permissive hypotension. So, you know, a letting a little bit lower blood pressure ride than you would normally. TXA as well. Oh, TXA as well. Uh, yeah, absolutely. TXA uh, or, uh, you know, the other major centers can replace specific clotting factors and that sort of thing. Um, um, now, do Jehovah Witness have any problems with, um, like like that, like partial blood products? That's a great question. So, uh, yeah. So, if Jehovah's Witnesses, like any group, are not a monolith. So, they are, their beliefs are not the same across all different people. Um, it is pretty uh, unanimous that they do not accept whole blood or red blood cells. Okay. Some will accept fresh frozen plasma, cryoprecipitate, and platelets, um, but the majority won't. Um, there are quite a few patients who will accept albumin. And yeah. though that is not, uh, um, uh, albumin actually does not need to be typed. That's something I, I learned uh, uh, through this case. So that can be given unmatched. Um, it won't really, uh, it won't improve their uh, oxygen carrying capacity, but it would say help draw more fluid into the uh, intravascular space. So that's something that would have been really helpful in this case. Actually, it turns out the community hospital doesn't carry it, so we wouldn't, have been able to, yeah. wouldn't be able to get some anyway, but it's something for, for us to think about or other people to think about in the future. And an FFP, too, is, can be good for um, some volume replacement as well if you can't Absolutely. get blood, and it's, it's definitely better for you than saline. Yeah, totally. So some Jehovah's Witnesses would take FFP, most of them wouldn't, but these are things you can ask right ahead of yep. time. Um, we didn't have the chance to do that before we leave. As you know, we just grab... Uh, uh, fresh plaque cells, but uh, yeah, great point. Yeah. So uh, optimize oxygen to de delivery and consumption. So that goes without saying. So we've got less hemoglobin circulating. We want to make sure at least the hemoglobin that we do have is getting all the oxygen that it needs. So that uh, supplemental oxygenation, intubation, ventilation, treating any underlying pathology in the lungs. Uh, the major centers can do uh, ECMO, uh, extra corporeal membrane oxygenation, uh, or red blood cell substitutes. So there are some some uh, Military, again, has been experimenting with some oxygen-carrying fluids. I, I don't, if anybody has more information on that, I'd love to hear. I don't think there's any that are at market that are, like, I in widespread use. Now. But that's kind of a neat thing. Uh, enhanced hemoglobin synthesis and production, we talked about that. So iron supplements, B12, folate, uh, EPO, uh, erythropoietin, and then correct coagulation defects. So um, keeping them warm. Right, that's going to be that's going to help them clot. Uh, we already talked about that. Replacing clotting factors, we talked about that. TXA, vitamin K, that's another thing they can give. Vitamin K shots, um, FFP, all that stuff that you and I talked about. Um, let's see here. So we talked about this. <clears throat> um, yeah, I think. I think we've sort of covered all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. But yeah, um, what I learned from this case was just that um, the importance of blood, I learned about how uh, managing people on the ventilators, uh, you don't always have to have normal blood gases. You can tolerate blood gases that would normally be considered abnormal, as long as they're not critical. Um, you can tolerate, um, uh, um, yeah, a little more acidosis. Ketamine works great as what they call a monotherapy. So it, we used only ketamine to maintain intubation with this patient. It worked phenomenally well. Um, and uh, I think sometimes the best thing you can do is not to treat. And, uh, you know, this was one where I did a lot of sitting on my hands because, you know, weighing the risks, uh, you know, I, I felt like I would only do more damage if I tried to uh, correct more than what I was correcting. 
um, than if I just left it alone. I don't know if you've come across those situations yourself, but sometimes they can be the most difficult situations for uh, for a patient. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I actually just recently had a patient who was refusing uh, the one treatment that I had that would help him. Um, and I'm just like, well, if that's, this is why I think you should have it. Mm-hmm. Um, this is what it will do for you. But if you say no, that's your choice. Yeah. And, uh, and, and at least that for 25 minutes to the hospital. And, you know, every once in a while I'd be like, you sure you don't want that? No. Nope, okay. Yeah. You yeah. Gotta, you got to respect patient's wishes. Yeah, absolutely. And we can get into this, this belief of like, uh, well, we're sitting in a workshop, so it's a perfect analogy, but when you're holding a hammer, everything looks like a nail because we have all these things to treat people. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right thing or that it's the right thing for them or yep. that they want it. Right. Um, and, uh, yeah. And then, you know, communication is cooperation. So, um, whether it was the ground crew that went to pick up this patient, our uh, coordinating with the hospital, talking to the receiving doctors down south, uh, all our members of our logistic team are dispatchers, um, you know, uh, in reality. Specialists. What's that? Specialists. The specialists. So. Um, the reality is, though, you know, a lot of people might be looking at this and going, my gosh, seven hours post-event. But we, know, you and I know about the geography that we're talking about. We're talking about an hour outside of a small town uh, in a territory north of the 60-degree latitude you know, it's out there. Yeah. And we were able to get this patient alive to the trauma center. Um, you know, I think that that's a, that's a win for everybody involved and, and uh, great communication came in with all that, you know, whether it was uh, coordinating the RSI with the physicians and changing, you know, making sure we changed something when we weren't successful and, you know, just discussing the pros and cons of like, Hey, maybe we don't need to take a whole bunch of x-rays cause they're going to get a CT when we get there. You know, all these little things came into play and uh, wound up working really well. So, yeah, I mean, that's probably, uh, that's it for me and for this case. Uh, this is, this is to date, been one of the most interesting cases. Uh, interestingly enough, probably the, the second most interesting case I ever had was this past week. So we'll talk about that one another time. Yep. I know Ryan's got some good ones. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's really all I've got. Ryan, anything to add? Uh, I think we should talk about what ended up happening to the patient. Um, yeah. Just because I feel like it, it closes it off and it also shows that... Uh, well, yeah, but we don't always win. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this patient was admitted to ICU. Um, all of those uh, temporizing measures that we talked about to try to get the patient to produce his own red blood cells um, were, were, were used. His wishes were respected. Uh, and unfortunately, the patient never maintained uh, enough stability to be able to go to the operating room. So he died, uh, unfortunately, three days later from his injuries. Um, and, uh, you know, th- that's not um, uncommon. For, for these sort of injuries, not uncommon for individuals who can't receive blood. Um, um, but everything that could be done was done. And in the end, uh, surgery was the, was the, uh, surgery is the definitive treatment for trauma. And the yes. reality is, is that patients actually do, contrary to popular belief, patients need to have a, a bit of stability before they go to the OR. And that was just not able to, uh, to happen. So, um, yeah, you know, not, we, not every uh, outcome is good in, in this profession, but no. um, but we do the best we can, and, and I think that uh, that we did everything that we could, and that everybody put in a remarkable effort, and uh, and I know that uh, and I know that the family was was very grateful that uh, the autonomy and the wishes were respected. So I think we did the best we could. And sometimes those are the calls you can learn the most from. Yeah, absolutely. I learned a ton from this case, and. <laughs> um, I'm so grateful, uh, you know, uh, to, to live up in the north, um, and uh, and I recognize that there are some some challenges in that, and uh, I think we do the best that we can with them. And it was great that we were able to share this with everybody, and and uh, hopefully some people have some ideas for us, and and they've learned something. Until the next time. Yeah. All right. Great. Have fun. <laughs>